Open your little mouth now. Grandma Rivera gripped the back of my neck with her left hand and palmed the bar of soap deeper into my mouth with her right. I struggled as little as possible. Struggling only made it worse. I hardly even winced when the soap cracked two baby teeth from my gums. You defend that weird man. You must be a little weird all yourself. You'll be clean, boy. I'll make sure of it. She mixed a cup of bleach into the near boiling water of the bathtub. What did he do to you, boy? Huh? The steel wool tore flecks of skin off my back as she cleaned. A single tear fell from my right eye. The eye that was facing away from her, thankfully. Crying only made it worse. Word had gotten out that my third grade teacher had a boyfriend. Grandma Rivera was upset by this because my third grade teacher was a man. She ranted on for hours, quoting Bible verses, praying the rosary, lighting candles. When she had finally paused for a breath, I asked, But Grandma Rivera, what if God made him that way? Wouldn't God still love him? That question landed me in a bleach-filled bathtub with a bar of soap between my teeth. But that was Grandma Rivera for you. By the time I was 13, I developed a routine to stay under her radar. Every day was the same. Wake up at 5, chores until the bus came at 7, home from school at 3, chores until dinner at 5, prayers until bedtime at 7. All the while following her insane list of rules. I was hitchhiking my way out of the state by the time the clock struck midnight on my 18th birthday. Days turned into months then turned into years. Before I knew it, I was 30 years old and still couch surfing. I had never finished high school since I left in such a rush, so my job prospects had always been limited. But still, it was better to depend on food stamps and my friends' couches than to live under Grandma Rivera's roof. Or so I thought. A week ago, an Ivy League looking man showed up at the car wash that I worked at. Hello, sir. His voice sounded like an American imitation of a British accent. I'm looking for Julio Rivera. Rodriguez, I responded. Excuse me? I don't go by Rivera anymore. It's Rodriguez. Oh, delightful. He cheered while extending his hand. Jameson. Thaddeus Jameson. That's Esquire, of course. But my friends just uh, call me Thaddy. Oh, uh, well. I think I'd rather not. Oh, but of course. Of course, he said. Well, we're just getting to know each other, aren't we, Mr. Rivera? Look, man, I'm not trying to be an asshole, but is there something you want? I just got this job and I can't afford to get fired. Oh, I only want to tell you the news, sir. Two news is, that is. One good, one bad, I suppose. Which would you like to hear first? My right eye began to twitch as I looked down at him, debating whether or not cussing him out was worth losing my job. Well, I'll just get on with it then, he said. I've arranged for a plane and a car ride to take you to your grandmother's home in Colorado. My knees buckled. The faint scent of bleach tickled my nostrils. No, I stepped back. No, you can't make me. She can't make me. I won't. Well, of course she can't make you, sir. She's dead. The house was still in pristine condition. It was the one-bedroom, one-bathroom rancher with a broken-down, 1996 Toyota Corolla under the carport. 
I suppose that was mine now too. My hand was riddled with tremors as I slid the key into the lock. I half expected this to be a ruse. That Grandma Rivera would be waiting just behind the door with an electrical cord in hand, ready to switch my sins away. Click. The door unlocked. The door squealed as it swung open. Hello? I called out. Grandma Rivera, it's Julio, I'm here. Nothing. I stepped inside and I smiled. I'm here, you old hag, and you're not. I skipped through the house with my dirty sneakers on, breaking one of her rules. I'm here, and you're dead. I'm here, and you're in hell. For the first time since I could remember, I felt relief. As I celebrated, I came across the gigantic chalkboard in Grandma Rivera's kitchen. The behemoth was at least six feet tall and almost as wide, filled to the brim with rules. Hardly a speck of green background was left. I intended to break every one of them. The first few dozen rules were easy to break. 1. No swearing. 2. No television after dinner. 3. No dinner after sunset. 4. No self-pleasure. I broke that rule less than an hour after arriving. Hell, it was the first time I'd had privacy in years. Later, I sat on the plastic-covered couch, turned on RuPaul's Drag Race, and ate a microwavable pot pie at 10 p.m. before falling into a deep slumber. The piercing ring of the house phone yanked me from sleep. Gah, I had forgotten how awful that thing sounded. The sun pierced my eyes as I stumbled my way into the kitchen and lifted the receiver. Hello? I grumbled. Mr. Rivera, it's Daddy. How's the house treating ya? He exclaimed in a tone much too chipper for the hour. Jesus, that is. It's gotta be six in the morning. And I told you already, it's Rodriguez. Erm, um, it's early noon, sir. He responded. I was just calling to ensure you'd read over all the paperwork. Paperwork? What paperwork? The paperwork regarding the transfer of the estate, sir. The paperwork regarding your grandmother's requirements. What do you mean, requirements? You said this place was mine. That I was her only living heir. Well, yes, sir. However, she placed certain provisions in her will. You must follow them for some time. Otherwise, the estate will be transferred over to the firm. The firm? I guess that means you. Why, yes, Mr. Rivera. I could almost hear the sniffling little smirk. Yes, it does. I knew Thaddeus was probably having the house watched, waiting for me to mess up so he could take it from me. I didn't care. I had lived my life in a constant state of paranoia, afraid that Grandma Rivera would find and punish me. I had flashbacks of her abuse almost daily. I wet the bed until I was 23. That problem was particularly embarrassing because everybody I had slept on was someone else's. No one was taking this victory away from me. No one. I made my way back to the chalkboard. I was taken aback by the next rule on the list. 27. The garden gnome must face west in the daytime and south in the nighttime. I didn't remember this rule. What garden gnome? The caricature of a Mexican rancher she kept in the backyard. I stomped toward the back door, fingernails digging into my palms. I made my way to the so-called garden gnome, grabbed by the porcelain sombrero, and smashed it against the side of the house. 
I went back inside and I broke rule number four a few more times. By the time night came, I was laying on the couch with my feet on the armrest, one hand in a bowl of popcorn, the other gripping a lukewarm beer. I was 15 minutes into an episode of Queer Eye when I heard it. Grandma Rivera's old record player. It was the same song she listened to every night before bed. Mr. Sandman by the Cordats, the only record she had ever owned. The bowl of popcorn fell to the floor at the same time the beer spilled into my lap. I didn't react to either. I lay frozen like a deer in headlights. My heart beating so heavily, it vibrated my shirt. I'm not sure what time the music stopped, but it must have. I was torn awake once more by the shrieking of Grandma Rivera's old rotary phone. I fell off the couch. The last remnants of Bud Light falling out of the bottle along with me. I clambered into the kitchen and lifted the receiver. What? I shouted. Ah, Mr. Rivera, it's Daddy. A late start again today, huh? He chuckled. Still following the rules to the letter, I presume. Screw off, Thaddeus. I slammed the receiver back down and tore the cord out of the wall. I grabbed another butt out of the fridge, the breakfast of champions. I wasn't sure how long I would have the house before Thaddeus took it, so I had to get to work. I started picking rules at random. Number 57, no leftovers. All unfinished meals must be thrown outside in the garbage. I threw the refrigerator door open, pulled out these six chicken tenders I had left over from the night before, and shoved them into my mouth cold. I spent the rest of the day casually swiping through a dating app. Rule 4 wasn't entirely cutting it anymore. I fell asleep on the couch without receiving a single response. Typical. I was pulled from my slumber by the violent shattering of glass. I climbed out of the couch and collapsed onto the floor, the room spinning around me like an alcoholic during happy hour. Mr. Sandman was once again blaring from Grandma Rivera's bedroom. I took a deep breath and pushed myself into a standing position. Why won't you just leave me alone? I screamed. I ran down the hall toward the only bedroom and kicked in the door. There were broken shards of glass on the carpet and pieces of porcelain. The last remnants of the garden home that had been thrown through the window. Is this what you want, huh? This stupid song, this stupid gnome. I yanked the record player from the bedside table and slammed it into the ground. But what about what I wanted? I gripped a shard of porcelain, bloody in my hand, and began to carve away at Grandma Rivera's mattress. I wanted to call you Grammy. I wanted to bake cookies with you. I wanted to be loved. I collapsed onto the red-stained shreds of cotton and cloth below me and cried myself into a headache. The doorbell woke me this time. Through the people, I could see a puny figure in a size too large suit. Ugh. I only opened the door as far as the chain lock would allow. What do you want, Thaddeus? I groaned. Well, good morning, Mr. Rivera. Well, afternoon, I suppose, if you want to be technical. I tried to reach you by phone, but the call failed. Please, just leave me alone already. Is everything all right, Mr. Rivera? I noticed a broken window when I pulled in. You are aware that one of the conditions of transfer is keeping the house in the condition that you received it, yes? I almost hit him on the nose with the door when I slammed it shut. I strolled into the kitchen, eager to begin my new daily routine. 66. Never throw away what can be donated to charity. Huh. That kind of interferes with Rule 57, doesn't it? It took the junk collector three hours to show up after I had called. The bed, the record player, all of her clothes, blankets, and trinkets. I told them to take it all to the dump and to piss on them. The only thing I kept was the couch. I junked its plastic cover. 
I made a quick trip to the local market downtown and bought a bundle of sage. I didn't know much about vengeful spirits or ghosts, but I had heard that sage could ward them off. Night came quickly, but sleep did not. I laid motionless on the couch for hours. It was easy to be brave in the safety of daylight. Still, under the cloak of darkness, I began to regret breaking another rule and angering Grandma Rivera's spirit. It must have been past two in the morning when I had heard it. The faint sound of footsteps scuttling around in Grandma Rivera's room. It sounded like she was looking for something. Her record player, most likely. I climbed out of bed in a slow, deliberate manner. I tiptoed my way down the hall, careful not to step on any of the floors at creaky spots. When I finally reached the front of the partially kicked in bedroom door, I lit the sage. My hands weren't trembling anymore. It was time to finish this. I threw the door open and held the sage out in front of me like a priest warding off a demon. The power of cru- I froze. My intestines sank as I saw a dark figure huddled in the corner of the closet. My hands began to trouble once more and then the blood boiled throughout my veins. You! I threw the sage to the side and stepped forward. Please! A voice squeaked in a fake British accent. Don't hurt me, Mr. Rive Rodriguez. I was just trying to scare you away so I could take the property. I wasn't going to cause you any harm. I swear it. I should have known. I should have learned the lessons my childhood taught me. There are no vengeful spirits. There are no ghosts. The real monsters are people. People like Grandma Rivera. Like Thaddeus Jameson. The real monsters are the ones who look us in the face every day. If you'll excuse me, I have to teach Thaddeus what happens when you break the rules. I've long held a memory that has been the source of pain and anguish throughout my life since childhood. My psychiatrist is convinced my memories are warped in an attempt to suppress trauma, and I began to believe him. I'd been on anti-anxiety medication nearly 22 years, and anti-depression meds for 18. I had eventually been convinced that those memories were in fact a result of suppression. I was finally starting to move past it all. And then this afternoon, I saw it. I saw the hidden television channel I had been convinced was a false memory. And I screamed. My brother went missing when I was nine years old, and his friend was found dead in our living room. I was questioned as was my father, but the nature of Dan's death defied explanation and the lack of evidence made the case unsolvable, so it went cold. I was considered an unreliable witness after my tearful testimony to the police. In the following months, I was taken to a child a psychologist and eventually prescribed medications before undergoing years of repressed memory therapy. I was there when it happened though, and as of today, I'm now certain what I saw was in fact real. My parents raised Ryan and me in the suburb of Hatfield, Pennsylvania. We had a yard, a good education, good friends, and the latest 16-bit video game consoles. I was happy at age 9, enjoying the summer vacation as the sweltering heat of June baked the streets. My older brother Ryan was 14 and a bit of a smart ass, always cracking jokes and getting into trouble. But still, he looked after me and was always quick to stick up for me if any bullies made the mistake of giving me a hard time. I truly was lucky in retrospect. One weekend, when Dad was working and Mom had driven off to run errands, I was playing Genesis in my room, 
when Ryan began yelling from downstairs. Mike, get down here. Check this out. He called up from the living room. I heard the din of a scattered applause from the TV. I shuffled out of my room and peered down at Ryan, who had flashed me his trademark smile, marked by the mole on his cheek. It had been a sore spot growing up, and led to him growing thick skin after being called Marilyn Monroe many times in elementary school. I looked past my grinning brother to the TV, to an image that warped and shifted like a scrambled adult station, bending the image. Yeah, dad locks the adult channel perv, I called back. I shook my head but then the image on the TV fixed itself. On screen, there is a panel of sitting people whose faces looked somehow wrong. They had all the normal features, eyes, noses, and mouths, but they looked strangely shaped and sized like each was in the wrong place or perhaps the wrong shape. They looked deformed and almost fake, and it was pretty creepy. What the heck is it? I asked. Just come down here. Check this out. Ryan called and sat cross-legged in front of the glowing screen. I was curious and had nothing better to do. I shuffled my small feet down the carpeted stairs and stood next to Ryan, watching these strange people on screen. This is not a real station, Ryan stated emphatically. Look! He pointed his finger to the corner of the screen. The station read, 23.3, a station in between stations. He then pointed to the dial. Our TV was one of those old-fashioned dial sets. The knob was resting between stops. And this show was freaking weird. I then sat next to my brother as the image went in and out of a scrambled distortion. And we watched a TV show unlike anything I had seen before. Seven individuals with strange-looking faces all conversed in whispers between themselves. A shiny-faced bald man who appeared to be the show's host paced back and forth in front of a large, reflective black panel on the wall. The image bent and shifted as the scrambled effect came in and out, but I soon realized it was a large square of black glass, maybe 12 feet square, and likely fairly thick as well. After some deliberation, the seated individuals on the panel held up large cards with numbers from left to right. 3, 21, 53, 501, 413, 8, 42. I had no idea what those numbers could possibly mean, but I began to feel nervous watching. The people with pinched and strange features creeped me out more than anything. It was like they all had received severely botched plastic surgeries, warping them so far out of normal proportion that they all looked terrifying. What is this? I asked Ryan, who shushed me. I don't know. Stop talking. He snapped. The camera switched to show a close-up of the standing man, the presumed host. My skin crawled immediately once his close-up filled the screen. Ryan gasped and then said, God, under his breath. God was right. The man was bald, and the close-up revealed the skin on his grisly face was made up almost entirely of scar tissue. Shiny pink skin was pulled tight around the contours of his skull. It was reminiscent of a burn victim who had had his damaged skin grafted, but in a way that didn't make any logical sense. His teeth were pristine, sparkling white, but his lips were jagged, blended at the seam that was uneven as if they had been split and patched together by unskilled surgeons. It was like some horrifically butchered cosmetic surgery had been performed on him for the sole purpose of making him look more disturbing. 
The host peered into the camera with small, black eyes beneath the folded creases of misshapen lids. Little black beads had stared into me from the flickering screen. My neck hairs raised as he cocked his head slightly, as if he had become aware of something. I held my breath as he then excitedly pointed at the camera and spoke. 2913. 2913. The host called out in a muffled, strained voice through butchered lips. My brother and I looked at each other in shock. Our address was 2913 on our lane. It was surely a creepy coincidence, but I was nine years old and absolutely terrified at that point. Turn it off! I shouted, but Ryan had just gawked, his jaw hanging open as he watched the TV. The host pointed a twisted finger to the audience, a slew of about 20 individuals whose backs were to the camera. The person who had been pointed at then stood and turned to the side to move down the aisle. It was a woman who looked sickly and tired. She was gaunt, emaciated, with bags under her eyes above sunken cheeks. Her age was a mystery, as her face had been mangled in a similar fashion as the rest. There was no way to tell if she was 25 or 85. She dragged one foot behind her as the host kept pointing a gnarled finger at her. As she shuffled out of the aisle and into the path to the stage, it was clear her left foot was dangling at the base, connected only by the skin itself. Jesus Christ. Ryan exhaled in a hushed voice. The woman limped up the stairs to the black floored stage and made her way to the panel, taking a seat at the end of the strange looking individuals. A wide angled shot showed a black clad assistant rush over from behind a curtain stage left and hand her a placard reading 2913 in thick black numbers. These did not look like special effects and they were far too graphic for television, as far as I knew. Turn it off! I shouted to Ryan, but he seemed mesmerized by the bizarre television show. The camera then showed a close-up of the woman holding the sign, and my heart pounded in my chest. It wasn't a woman. It was a mutilated girl, much younger but cosmetically butchered just like the rest. Her face was scarred in lines under the eyes and cheeks, making her appear much older. She looked very familiar, however. It took me a while to figure out where I recognized that nose speckled with that particular pattern of freckles. I made the connection as my stomach sank into the floor. It was Amber Darton, the girl who had been all over the news after going missing presumed abducted from her yard last year. I had seen her face so many times in the papers, the post office wall, and even milk cartons. There was no mistaking it. It was impossible to ignore her. Her face had been terribly altered in what appeared to be an attempt to conceal her identity. Ryan, that's Amber Darton, the girl who had gone missing. I whimpered. I couldn't stand it anymore. Ryan, call the police! Uh, uh, you're right. Holy crap. Ryan stood up, stumbled back, and raced to the cordless kitchen phone. He picked it up and dialed. But just seconds later, the image on screen warped back into wavy bands of a scrambled station before clicking to channel 23, where a baseball game was being aired. No! I shouted and I approached the old TV set, hitting the side to try and restore the image. I fiddled with the knob, trying to balance it between stations, but it wouldn't stick or find that hidden station, no matter how slowly I rotated the dial. That strange show didn't come back, not when my mother returned home and listened to our pleas to believe us. Not when a uniformed police officer arrived at her door, which made our mother really lose it once she explained the hyperactive imagination of her boys.
forcing us to apologize to the man. Nobody believed us. Ryan and I were both determined to find the station throughout the week, but had no luck. The station clicked very clearly between the actual stations, and the phenomenon Ryan had discovered seemed to have been a one-time fluke. Might have been pirate broadcasters, Ryan told me one day. Back in 87, hackers did it in Chicago with a Max Headroom mask. I don't know. He sounded like he was desperately trying to get over it and dismiss it as a prank or a fluke. I don't think he wanted to face the possibility that what we saw was real. Days passed and I honestly thought that was the end of it. God, I wish it had been. A few weeks later, Ryan's friend Dan from school came over and they watched horror movies late at night after mom and dad were asleep. I sneak watched the thing from atop the stairs without them knowing. After it was finished, they began chatting about strange real life horror stories and unexplained phenomena. And then, Ryan brought up the show. There is a hidden television station, I swear to god. My little brother and I both saw it. Ryan explained to the scoffs of Dan, a larger kid who always wore leather jackets and fancied himself the long lost member of the misfits. Bullshit, Dan retorted after hearing the rundown of events. He smirked and then shook his head. If the station existed, hundreds or even thousands of people would have seen it. I swear it was real, man. Ryan walked up to the TV, fiddling with the station knob. We had done this dozens of times since the incident, and of course, there was never any signal again. Dan was chuckling as he drew a cigarette from a pack in his jacket pocket and headed to the door to go out for a smoke. But then it happened. There was a pop of static, a crackle as the image flickered, and then wavy bands of color streaked down the screen. Dan stopped mid-step, the unlit cigarette dangling from his lap. Holy crap, this is it! Ryan yelled out in a hushed tone to avoid waking our parents. I felt my gut squirm at the sight of it. It was something dangerous, something too dark to explore. Ryan and his tough guy friend Dan were the type to chase thrills though. I watched from the top of the stairs as those sickening faces appeared once again on the screen. The panel of disfigured individuals and that shiny skinned host with beady eyes and perfect teeth beneath the ravaged flash of his face. What the actual heck? Dan trailed off and he came back into the living room to watch the horrible show. This is crazy. I watched for a few seconds as the panel of individuals raised placards with numbers. 814 2 601 21B 3F 210 2002 The host faced the screen once more in a grotesque close-up. I twinged with a shiver at seeing that terrible, butchered face staring intently into the camera squinting malformed lids over shiny black eyes. 2913. 2913. Quick. He pointed a snarled finger to an emaciated male in the audience, who staggered slowly up and onto the stage to hold a newly painted card reading 2913. Our address. My throat closed and my heart pounded in my chest. The host then walked to the large, black glass square insert in the stage. I felt sick to my stomach, but couldn't look away. The black square pane of glass began to brighten, as if a light was being turned down from the other side. The illumination revealed a room of a house and two people facing the camera. My heart skipped a beat as I realized what I was seeing. Behind the glass was a reflection of our living room as viewed from the other side. Standing in it, facing the audience, was my brother Ryan and his friend Dan. 
What the heck, man? Dan shouted and took a step back from the screen. His actions were mirrored in the large square panel, as if it were a window to inside of our home. There was a harsh, distorted tone that rumbled through the TV, low and deep. It sounded for a second, stopped for two, and then sounded again on repeat. My fear had built to the point that I couldn't take it. Turn it off! I shouted from atop the stairs, only then alerting my brother and his friend to my presence. That analog, deep rumbling tone kept sounding, and my brother ran to the TV, fidgeting with the dial. The image remained as he switched stations. It remained even after he had pressed the power button. This can't be real, Ryan said. He yanked out the plug of the television, and the screen finally went black with a crackle. But then the tone sounded again, distorted and deep, rumbling loud enough to tremble the upstairs floor beneath the carpet. There was a sharp bang followed by the cracking of wood. Ryan screamed a shrill scream, facing the out-of-view front door of our home. I ran into my room and slammed my door shut, locking it with shaking fingers. There was a horrible series of snaps and crunches, followed by the most horrible, shrill scream I'd ever heard. Everything after was a blur. I remembered my parents' voices, confused by the sounds that awoke them. My mother's scream, frantic yelling, my parents checking if I was okay. Sirens, police, ambulances. Everyone was asking if I knew where Ryan was. I did not. Dan was found splayed on the carpet. His wrists, ankles, and neck had been severed clean through, though the skin remained unscathed. It was as if they had been severed from within his body. His official cause of death was listed as internal hemorrhaging, though how he got his injuries was a complete mystery. And that was the end of it. I grew up into a scarred adult with some issues due to the trauma. I have an Ativan with breakfast and Paxil at lunch. I've been to therapy sessions through my teenage years and into my adult life. I was convinced that there must have been some crazy trick. Or perhaps my mind had envisioned what it most feared on that screen. Ryan was presumed kidnapped and killed. We even had a funeral for him seven years after the incident once he was legally declared dead and absentee. I hadn't seen or heard from him in 30 years. Not until this afternoon. Today I was scouring the news and forcing down a TV dinner. I was flicking the stations and not paying attention to the channel, only to what was on. News, cooking, cartoons. And then my blood froze. I stared at the image I had struggled all my life to convince myself was a delusion, a vivid hallucination, or some transfigured, repressed memory. The station read, 23.3, and the familiar, nightmarish television set appeared once again. It was that same studio stage, and a row of disfigured people who appeared to have had horrific plastic surgeries. They were all new, butchered faces but the exact same setup. The host was a bald, heavily scarred man, but clearly a different person. I watched the familiar routine of raising signs of street addresses when the close-up cam fixed on the mutilated visage of the host. 21B, 21B, he gurgled frantically, his crooked finger aiming at the screen before lowering to single out a woman in the audience. My heart stumbled in my chest until it hurt. My throat dried and my eyes widened with dread. I felt the icy claw of horror trace down my spine. I lived in apartment 21B on my street, but it wasn't the address that sent me screaming out my apartment door, down the stairs and into the streets. It was the butchered face of the host. It was the unmistakable mole on his mutilated cheek. Crap, 
It's been a while since I've posted anything on Reddit. I'm terrified. I'm sitting outside of a Starbucks using their free Wi-Fi with a Reddit account that I just made because it's the only way I'm able to get anything out there. A lot of crazy stuff has happened recently, and I'm just not talking about the stupid virus. That's the least of my worries right now. I'm writing here to try to work out what's going on, because it's all just so mind-boggling. Maybe some of you can help me. I don't know how though. This whole situation is just freaking me out. Ever since quarantine hit, I've been getting into writing more and more. With all this free time, what else is there to do? My stimulus check gives me just enough money to make it through each month if I only eat once a day. It's not like I'm moving around too much anyways, so the lack of food is not really a problem. No one is really out and about. My family lives in a different state. I don't have any roommates. And I'm not great at keeping contact with people. So I don't really have anyone to talk to. I also haven't been having any luck on any of the dating apps that I've downloaded. So there haven't even been any quarantine violating dates or hookups going on. So, as I was saying, I've been writing a lot more than usual. Mostly poems and some short stories. But recently, I got inspired to start writing a fantasy novel. For short stories, I don't need to have a fully fledged idea of who the characters are, or what they will look like. But for novel ideas, I like taking my time painstakingly creating perfect characters. It's a flaw of mine as a writer, since I can get so caught up in who the characters are that I forget about the plot. I wanted to do something to change that, but I didn't know what until I stumbled upon this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. For those of you who do not know, thispersondoesnotexist.com is a website that uses some sort of artificial intelligence to automatically generate faces of people who presumably do not actually exist. Every time you refresh the page, you get a new face. I learned about this website completely by accident. I was watching a YouTube channel run by a person that tracks down and exposes predators online. He found a face of a little girl in that website so he didn't have to use a photo of a real child when catfishing these monsters. As soon as I watched that part of the video, it clicked. I could get myself out of my character creation trap by just refreshing the website a few times until I found a picture that I could model my characters off of, giving me more time to work on the plot and actually write the story that I wanted to write. The first thing I noticed about this website is that it was a bit surreal. Some of the images looked like they were clearly computer generated, but most of the pictures looked like they could be real people. The uncanny valley effect is real on this website, and I found that I got a bit creeped out if I stayed on there too long. But it was very helpful when looking for character models. After a few minutes, I found faces for the best friend, the love interest, the main villain, and some important side characters. The only face I had left to find was the face that was going to belong to the main character. None of the faces felt right, no matter how many times I hit refresh. After a few more page refreshes, I saw it. My smiling face. I felt my heart rate spike. It looked exactly like me. My slightly crooked nose. The one dimple that appeared when I smiled. The smallest chip on my right front tooth from a drunken party. Every detail was eerily accurate. 
I didn't know. I couldn't refresh the page. I don't mean that I was frozen in fear. I clicked the refresh button and the page did not refresh. I tried clicking the little X button on the top left of the browser window, but an error message popped up. Error. This person does not exist. I closed the window and stared at that thing. Me. It. I don't know. All I knew is that I definitely had to take a break from my computer. It was probably just a glitch. I forced my computer to restart and decided that I should get out of the house for the first time in weeks. A breath of fresh air might be just what the doctor ordered and it would probably give my computer enough time to restart. I grabbed my keys, phone, and headphones but decided against wearing my mask. It was past midnight, so there probably wouldn't be too many people walking around anyways. I pulled my hoodie over my head and exited my apartment, locking the door behind me. The air was still. Even though the downtown area is usually pretty noisy, I felt like I could hear a pin drop from the next block. It was as if the whole city was holding its breath. I put on my headphones and began playing some music to make the situation less creepy, and I began walking. I tried thinking positive thoughts. I didn't have to constantly sidestep to avoid other oncoming pedestrians. I could quietly sing songs out loud without getting weird looks. These small positives made me feel safe enough to justify walk into the park and then back to my apartment again. The street lamps illuminated the up and coming main road. A homeless man and his dog lay sleeping by a building. The same place they were stationed since the last time I went to get groceries. This dog was usually very easily excitable, even when asleep. However, the large Rottweiler didn't wake up and bark when I approached them. I felt a sense of relief that the man would be able to get some sleep without having his dog waking him up. I felt around my sweater pockets for some change, but I couldn't find any. I haven't handled hard cash in a while, since most of my shopping is now done by Carter online. Feeling a bit guilty, I continue walking towards the park. I begin to sing and dance a bit to the music as I walked, trying to forget about seeing my face on that website. It had to be a mistake, maybe a glitch, or maybe I misremembered the image, something. Maybe I should spend less time on the computer, but what else am I supposed to do during quarantine? Someone was walking out of an apartment building that I was walking towards. A guy about my age, readjusting his hair as he took out his phone and he yawned. He probably just finished a hookup and was checking the bus schedule. Lucky guy. He looked up from his phone as I passed and I gave him a slight nod. He didn't react. Weird, but he seems exhausted. It is way past midnight after all. He probably just spaced out. I kept walking. When I got to the park, I took a seat on the bench and let my headphones rest around my neck. The darkness was pushed back by the light of an overhead street lamp, so I could see everything clearly. The great field of grass that stretched out before me is usually a great picnic spot for families, friends, and couples alike. The sounds of laughter and barking dogs were now replaced by empty silence. The field entirely populated by empty picnic tables and trees. It seemed too cold for the bugs to be out, which was a pleasant surprise for a dark summer night like this one. A young woman approached where I was sitting and took a seat on the other side of the bench. Her curly hair was up in a bun and it looked like she had bags under her eyes. A fellow insomniac perhaps. She seemed withdrawn, 
since she barely regarded my existence. She must want to talk to me though, otherwise she probably wouldn't have sat on the same bench as me. I decided to bite the bullet and talk to the first human I've spoken to in a considerably long time. So, you can't sleep either, huh? No reaction. Did she hear me? I tried again. Hey, um, I was wondering if you wanted to chat for a bit. It's okay if you don't want to. Still no reaction. I guess that's a no. I felt a bit let down, but I didn't want to creep her out more than I already have. I got up to walk back to my apartment, feeling exceptionally embarrassed. As I started walking, the thoughts of my face on that website entered my mind. I stopped in my tracks. Error. This person does not exist. My heart skipped a beat. Could I really? No, that would be stupid. It's just a website, and I'm going to prove it. I walked over to the young woman sitting on the bench. Against my better judgment, I stood directly in front of her and spoke, half expecting to be slapped in the face. Alright, this is going to sound crazy, but it's been a bit of a weird night. If you say blue right now, I promise that I will leave and not bother you anymore. The woman opened her mouth and... and sneezed. She didn't say blue. She didn't react to what I said at all. It was as if I wasn't even there. I waved my hand in front of her face and she stared past me. Still no reaction. A cold realization washed over me. My heart began pounding against my ribcage. I could feel the blood pumping through each individual vein and capillary. I began to hyperventilate. This was really happening. Somehow, I don't exist anymore. I stood there for a while. It all started making sense. The homeless man's dog now waking up when I had walked past. The guy who didn't seem to see me. This woman who wasn't reacting to anything that I was doing, even though I was acting like a bit of a maniac. No one reacted to anything I did because I didn't exist. No, that's crazy talk. Very, very crazy talk. I have to be dreaming. I pinched my forearm. It hurt, but I didn't wake up. This was very, very bad. I ran back to my apartment to check my computer. Even though I haven't exercised in months, I was running on a reserve of energy that I had no idea existed. I was outside of my apartment in a matter of minutes. I impatiently punched in my apartment code and darted inside of the building. I didn't want to wait for the elevator. So, I took the stairs two at a time. As I approached my floor, I took out my keys. My house key was turning the lock in my apartment door in seconds, and I flung the door open, not caring who I woke up. Sweat made my sweater cling to my body, but that didn't matter. I dashed to my computer. Except it wasn't my computer. The laptop was different. The background was different. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know how to feel. In a futile attempt to rectify the situation, I entered my password. Incorrect password. Please enter a valid password to sign in. Shit, I have to remember to lock my door. Said a voice coming from behind me. I was so focused on the computer that I didn't even hear the door open. I quickly closed the laptop and stood up. The woman from the park tossed her sweater on the couch as she made her way into the bedroom. I began to panic. 
but she still didn't seem to notice me. I didn't exist. And so this wasn't my apartment anymore. I watched her open the laptop that wasn't mine. I decided that it was time for me to leave. I walked outside of the apartment building in a daze. I wandered around the area until I stumbled across a Starbucks and I sat down next to a locked door. Through the glass, I could see the chairs all stacked on the tables covered in a thin layer of dust. Everything seemed so bleak. I pulled on my phone to see the default background instead of the familiar image of my childhood cat. I swiped up and the phone unlocked. None of the apps that I had downloaded were there anymore. All of my contacts and photos were gone. My phone had changed, even though it was with me this entire time. I felt defeated. I needed to prove that I still existed. I'm usually a lurker on here, but now I'm getting desperate. And that's why I connected to the free Wi-Fi to re-download Reddit and make this account. I don't know how much longer this will go on, but I hope that it's not much longer. I need a reassurance. I need recognition. I need help. Please, help me. Sleep has been impossible for the last few weeks. At first, I blamed the moon. And when the moon changed, I blamed Mercury. But now Mercury has come and gone too, so maybe it's just me. After this many nights without sleep, I knew that hallucinations are not far behind. So I've started taking long, directionless drives in the dead of night, just to keep the nightmares at bay. I don't aim for anywhere in particular, just to cruise the desolate roads by the docks and old factory buildings and the shabbier parts of town. All that matters is I outrace the horrors inside of my own head. So far, it's been working. Last Monday, though, something strange happened. It was the darkest time of night, sometime between 2 and 3, when even the ghosts are afraid to go out. But that didn't stop me. I was rolling along slowly down a street that I had traveled many times before. It runs parallel to an old cannery, a long imposing monolith of crumbling brick, tiny windows and near the top scabbed over by years of decay. I reached a busted traffic light swinging in the sea breeze. Ahead of me stretched endless rows of boarded up tenements, to my right and left only darkness. On a whim, I took a coin out of my pocket, flipped it, heads for right, tails for left and allowed Chance to take the wheel. I continued driving, past vacant lots full of skeletal cars long ago stripped for parts, past empty warehouses that had lost the ward of the night and been swallowed half up by shadow, down streets that no one had ever given a name. Every time I reached an intersection, I flipped the coin, right and then left, and then left and then right, I surrendered myself to blind chance until I lost all sense of direction and found myself in places that I had never seen before. A strange second city hidden inside the shadow of the first. At last, I had reached a dead end. No more turns to take. This is my destination, then I thought. I reached for my car door and I prepared to exit into the night. But as I began to open the door, I paused. I wondered, where had the coin toss taken me? What was waiting for me outside at the safety of the car? And did I dare find out? On another night, perhaps, I would have answered a no and driven straight home. But these sleepless have no use for home and little fear of death. I knew what hallucinations awaited me if I turned back and gave in to my insomnia. The tall, smiling man with his long, wet fingers. 
the scarlet skinned lady with her inside out face, and so many other nameless grotesques who adjourned to illuminate me with their torments. A throbbing lump coiled in my gut, told me that these old familiar faces were close. And so, more ready to brave the unknown than to submit to those well-known horrors, I left the car behind and I vanished into the dark. The coin toss had led me to an old canal, dredged up years ago and now bone dry. A chain link fence restricted access only in theory. I quickly found a man-sized hole to slide through, and descended a set of iron rungs down into the bare cement channel. I looked up and down the seemingly endless canal, seeing only darkness in both directions. I did not hesitate for long though. The visions I was running from were close behind me, and it was only down here that I could escape from them. I knew this in my bones. And so I walked on, on and on through those colossal veins that carried blood no more, guided less by the dim moonlight than by the things that nipped at my feet, threatening to burst forth through my skull if I slowed down or stopped to look back. I walked until my feet blistered, and then I kept on walking more, never stopping, never pausing ever following the path that emerged before my eyes and vanished behind my footsteps. Half real, like a momentary illusion of form in a ribbon of smoke. There was no real form here though, only emptiness. My heartbeat echoed before me as I went headfirst into the emptiness, all alone, until I reached a dead end. A place where the canal widened on all sides into what must have once been a lake. There was no water anymore though, only a parched basin, here and there scattered with rocks, dust, skeletons of fish, old nails, broken bottles, overturned oil drums, the cold remnants of campfires. I kicked at one of them, scattering ash and charcoal. As soon as I did so, I realized that I was no longer alone. There is a faint glow a few yards ahead of me, a pale fire that I had not noticed at first amidst the gray gloom that shrouded the once lake. A group of men was huddled around the dismal flame, maybe two dozen in total. I got very close before they even looked up at me, so transfixed were they by the warm, seductive dance of the flames. I noticed one last thing as I drew close to them, lying on the ground several feet away from the rest of the party, was a large heap, perhaps a pile of laundry or old rags, covered in a white sheet. None of them paid it the slightest attention, but in a way they seemed very deliberate, as if they were very purposefully not looking at it. I stopped as I reached the edge of their circle and I cleared my throat. They turned to look up at me, and their dazed, almost trance-like stares transformed into bright, chipper smiles. The man closest to me, a fat, bald, bewhiskered black man wearing a brown coat, stood and greeted me. Welcome, stranger, he said, opening his arms for an embrace, or at least a very enthusiastic handshake. I opted for the latter but kept my distance. If my jolly greeter noticed my coldness, he didn't seem to mind. Pull up a seat, warm your toes, slake your thirst. You've come just in time. William, pour our newcomer a little of that glug. A mug of something warm and sweet smelling made its way around the fire and into my hands. I tried to turn it away, but my hosts were insistent. Before I knew it, I was sitting on an upturned bucket, and biting the hot, steamy glug, and listening to a round of introductions. My poorly new friend gave his own name last. And of course, I'm Jack. Jack be nimble, Jack be quick. Jack's eaten too much and grown quite thick. He laughed deeply at his little rhyme, but I saw the others smirk and roll their eyes. 
An old line, no doubt. He went on. None of the other fellows talk as much as me, which makes me the leader here de facto. Nobody talks as much as you, Jack, protested an old stooped over man with wrinkled up skin. And I don't remember voting for no leader. That may be true, Cornelius, that may be true. But then again, none of you gentlemen would be here if I hadn't come around first, now would you? This delightful tapestry of camaraderie would be nothing more than a tangle of threads if I hadn't stitched us all together. I do believe. So forgive me for tooting my own horn just a little bit. Cornelius grunted. As long as that's the only thing you're tooting, he said. The men laughed long and hard at this one. None more so than Jack himself. I chuckled a little myself, I'll admit, and I settled into my seat. The fire was quite nice, humble as it may have seemed at first, and it warmed my chilled bones. The glug was even nicer. I took another deep swallow and felt it toast me from my fingertips to my toes. I let out a loud, satisfied belch, and the men gave me a cheer. A man after our own heart, cried out Jack. Pray tell, my friend, what brings you to our little society tonight? It's not unheard of us to have visitors, but it's always an occasion worth noting. I thought about how to answer this question. All of the lies I could think of seemed too implausible. So I went with the least plausible of them all. The truth. I haven't been sleeping, I said. I went for a drive, flipped a coin. I ended with a pause looking nervously around to see the men's bafflement. But to my surprise, they nodded instead, as if they understood completely, as if no other answer would have made sense. I had not shocked them, apparently. Say no more, said Jack wistfully. Insomnia is a cruel mistress, and one that every man here has served at one time or another. It's what's brought us all together, actually. You could say it's the driving force behind our informal association. I was a little surprised to hear this. Had I stumbled upon some sort of support group for insomniacs? At three in the morning, around a campfire in a dried up old canal. I asked them slowly. None of you can sleep either. That's why you're all here. The men fell silent. They looked at their feet. After a tense moment, Jack replied delicately. Well, at first, that was certainly the case. Every one of us sat around this fire the first time because we were hounded by insomnia, a prisoner to that endless night. But over time and together, we have conquered that affliction. He repeated once more, for emphasis. Together. I looked around the circle at my fellow insomniacs. Though they avoided looking directly at me for some reason, I could still see it in their eyes. A sort of haunted, hollow look. A weariness that never quite goes away, no matter how much you have slept. A look that betrays a man acquainted with all of the darkest chambers of his own psyche. Yes, there was no doubt about it. These men suffered from the plague of sleeplessness, or at least they once had, for I knew that look all too well. I saw it on my face every time I looked in the mirror. After a long silence, I asked the question that they must have known was coming, but for some unknown reason, I was hesitant to speak aloud. Can you help me then? The men bristled, as if a nasty wind had blown through them. But it was not that they were offended at my question. Their reaction was quite the opposite, I think. Like a wolf that smells a lamb's blood from miles away, they shifted in their seats and exchanged enigmatic glances with one another. Jack spoke once more, and when he did, his voice dripped like 
poison, Tania. Your cure is here for the taking, my friend. The only question is, will you take it? I looked around the circle of men, their eyes now lit with the glow of some other greater fire. They were all men, in case I didn't say before. Sad, lonesome men. Fat, unkempt, thin-haired, their clothes torn and tattered, their faces pale and creased. Forgotten men, miserable men, living for nothing, not even themselves. And yet, here they all were. Here I was. Unlike myself, though, there was something else at work inside of these men. Something frightening and brilliant. I could see it in the way they stared without blinking. The way they seemed to look through me. They didn't speak, but I swore that I could hear voices in my head. Come with us. They said in whispers, thin as a spider silk. Walk with us to the places you cannot see. Down streets with no end. Seek what we have sought. Find what we have found. Eat at our table. Join us in our long sleep. A strange tingle traveled from my fingertips to the top of my scalp, hot and cold at the same time. A voice answered Jack that sounded like my own but the words seemed to come from somewhere far away. I will take it. I looked down at the still steaming mug in my hands and asked myself, for the first time, what am I drinking? The answer seemed to please the men. They relaxed their tensed up muscles, regained their smiles. Jack rose to his feet and held his hand out to mine. He was so much taller than he had first appeared, his arms like tree trunks, his face a colossal effigy carved into stark and morbid angles by the moonlight. It wasn't just him though. All of the men were transforming, expanding, limbs stretching like taffy, faces ballooning into giant, misshapen masks, eyes the size of dinner plates, teeth like a wall of skulls and an ancient catacomb. Jack took my hand in his. I was puny in his grip, like a lifeless marionette, a fragile toy that he could smash against the wall if he so choose. But he was gentle with me, brought me to my feet and sent me alongside the other men, who all began to stand as well. Even as they got to their feet, they continued to transform. Their skin rippled and unfurled past the limits of their former bodies, bones stitching together out of nothing to fill out the new tapestries of flesh. I tried to watch the process closely, but I found it difficult to focus on only one body for very long. Ruptures began to appear in the new folds of skin the longer that I looked. Eyes dissolved into faces. New orifices sprouted beneath fingernails. Eventually, I just shut my eyes, afraid the bodies would unravel completely if I kept watching any longer. And amidst this catastrophe of flash, the world itself began to disjoin. Wind swept in from all around us, lifting the debris off the canal floor. The fish bones, the discarded bottles and cans, the remains of old campfires, all swirled around us in a hurricane of refuse. I could barely make out the night beyond the storm. The hair on my arms prickled up, lightning ready. I felt a metallic tingle on my tongue and tasted sweet, iron-scented blood. Above me, the moon blinked, momentarily scarlet, and then it vanished. Even battered by the winds, Jack stood as sturdy as an oak. His eyes were serious, meant business. With swooping gestures, he conducted the other men. Three of them gathered around the sheet-covered lump that I had noticed earlier. The others formed a wide circle around those three, joined hands and shut their eyes. I was slightly surprised to find that I had joined them. I felt iron-strong hands gripping me on both sides, and yet, still not completely lost to their control, 
I kept my eyes open. I wanted to see what we were being shown. Satisfied with our clockwork obedience, Jack began to spin around us, almost in time with the storm, shouting against the wind. He spoke in no language that I had ever heard. Words old like fossils, coated in horrible double and triple meanings. I couldn't understand them, per se, but they nevertheless conjured visions in my mind of hideous, grasping things at the edges of my sanity, of dark packs made by sleepless madmen with ancient gods, of a ritual, centuries old, which I had chanced upon by the flipping of a coin. To this last thought, the spiderweb chorus of the other men once again responded in my mind, mockingly. Chance, chance. you think you, you were think brought, you brought here by chance, chance. Mo, little Mo little one. one. There is so much more that you still do not see. And if on cue, in response to another gesture from Jack, the three men around the mysterious pile lifted the sheet, released it to the wind, let it fly through the air and join the storm. The sheet bearers leapt immediately into the circle, their eyes shut the entire time. I looked around me at the men now chanting back the words that Jack had supplied to them. My own lips moved in time with theirs, the syllables on my lips at once unknowable and familiar. And yet still, I did not close my eyes, so that only Jack and I saw who was underneath the sheet. The victim's body, fat and plump and milky white, stood out grotesquely against the darkness all around us, like a raw wet chicken carcass floating in a pool of crab. A thick cord bound his hands and feet, but other than that, he was completely exposed. Naked and shivering despite the warmth of the fire, exposed to us now, he began to cry out, his pathetic simpering at odds with Jack's tone of grandeur. It was hard to make him out through the storm, but I did catch some snatches of what he was saying. Help! Sweet Jesus, I have children! Why? I wanted to move to help him. You have to believe me about that. I wanted to break the circle, knock down Jack and untie the cords from the man, run home and call the police, or else just forget that I ever saw anything. But I didn't. I stood still, unable to move a muscle. Maybe I was paralyzed. Maybe just cowardly. Or most horrible of all. Maybe I was curious. Whatever it was, all I could do was watch. I watched. Watched as Jack himself lost control. A slight twinge of fear playing in his eyes as his lips stopped moving but his voice kept going. Watched as the wind lifted the naked, struggling victim into the air, towards the place where the absent moon was lurking. Watched as a seam in the darkness tore and they arrived in the places that they had been hiding, between the cracks of a distant starlight. They came, carried by wings tattered and bloodstained, their voices high like shattering glass, their faces empty of every feature save an endless, gaping mouth. Even Jack had shut his eyes in fear when they came. Next to him, even his now monstrous body was dwarfed, I don't know how many of them there were, maybe a million, maybe just one. Moving so rapidly, it multiplied in my sight. I think my eyes were never meant to look at such things, and what I saw was just an approximation of something hideous and incomprehensible beyond imagination. Approximation or not, it was enough to annihilate my last dredges of belief in the order of the universe. The victory of light against dark, order against chaos. I knew then that the hallucinations that I had been struggling to outrun that night were nothing more than a shadow cast by the true horrors of existence. The words I record here can never be more than an echo of that profound and shattering moment, but still, they are all that I can offer. The last thread of my sanity allows me to share 
nothing more or less than this. The victim hung in space, screaming mutely. The ones that had come had no eyes, but somehow they regarded him. Coldly measured his worth as a meal. Noiseless words passed between them, and they seemed to come to an agreement. He will do. When they finally came for him, they were fast, brutal, and bloodless. A precise scissor cut through the necks of paper dolls. A dampened fingertip squeezing out a candle. They swooped towards him through the night, entered through his mouth, and cascaded out of his eyes in the next instant. It took them no time at all to find what they had come for. As quickly as they had come, they vanished once more, back to their hellish nest on the other side of creation. Back to that world which I now know lies just beyond this one, and always has. For a brief moment before they parted, the air around me shimmered, and I could tell you that I saw that world. The edges of my vision blurred, and briefly for less than a second, I swear, I grasped just how thin the curtain of our reality was. The secrets that lurked behind it were so much greater, shined so much brighter, screamed so much louder, and then it was gone. The moon blinked back into the sky once more, and the night was still. For a long moment, nobody spoke. The victim, now lifeless, lay on the ground in front of us. His body showed no outward signs of his trials, no wounds or scars, but he wasn't screaming anymore. His eyes were gray and vacant. There was no one at home. Jack, now fully in control once more, looked around as all the other men slowly opened their eyes. We were all back to our normal size now. The excesses of mere moments ago felt worlds away. I felt the cold night air on the back of my neck, and I wiggled my toes. I could move once more, on my own accord. If I wanted to, I could run home, fast as my legs would carry me, run far away from the horrors that I had chanced upon. At least I told myself that I could run away. In reality, I stayed still, waited tensely for the next moment. Jack stepped towards the body slowly and bent down to him. He lifted up one of his pale fat arms and dropped it limply back to the ground where it landed with a sickening plop. He nodded, seemingly satisfied, and then looked back up at us. Fire burning brightly in the wells of his eyes beckoned us towards him. He snapped his fingers and spoke a single word. Feed. The men advanced gently, rhythmically. When each one reached to grab his piece, there was no fighting over portions or haggling over the prize cuts. There was nothing uncivilized about the meal, is what I mean. They were all well-mannered, deliberate, courteous even, helping each other to snap off a bit of tendon tear loose a chunk of fat, break the skull to get at the best bits. Blood pooled around the body, lapped at their feet, and some inevitably got it on their fingers, but they were not messy. They chewed before they swallowed, lingered over each morsel, savored the tastes and textures. It was a remarkably tasteful spectacle. Only Jack did not join in the meal, instead walking over to where I stood, some distance from the rest. He put a jovial arm around my shoulder, exactly as if we had just won a soccer match. It can be an awful lot to take in the first time, I know, he said. His voice was so considerate and understanding that I could harbor no resentment towards him, despite my best efforts. He went on, but you wouldn't have come here tonight unless you were ready. That's just not how it works. So, take your time. And when you are ready, well, the boys won't touch your portion, I promise. 
He clapped my back and walked behind me into the darkness. I turned around before he could disappear completely though. Wait, Jack. I called out and he paused. I chose my words carefully, wrestling with my question in my mind. Finally, I asked him, Do you... Do you sleep better now? After... After all of this? He turned around to face me, and I swear, I'll never forget the look in his eyes. I can sleep now, if I choose to. Wherever I am, I can close my eyes and swim in an ocean of sweet darkness. You will be able to also, if you so choose. Once he had spoken these words, he was gone. No more than a shadow among shadows. I gazed into the blackness beyond the fire's reach, but saw nothing. And so I turned back, towards the victim and the other men. They were finishing up. He was little more than bones now, but I saw that there was still some meat, enough for a single portion. I closed my eyes, breathed in deeply, and made my choice. Here I am now, a week later, and everything has changed. For five nights in a row, I've slept uninterrupted. No tossing and turning, no midnight bouts of sleep paralysis, no nightmares, no dreams at all in fact. Just like Jack said, I close my eyes and sleep is there. It waits for me like an old friend, cradling me in its tender, empty embrace until morning. I wake up totally refreshed, hungry to consume the daylight. I've been exercising, meeting friends, even thinking about going back to school. Everyone tells me, it's like you're a different person. If only they were right. If only the man who woke up in the mornings was some new person. Someone who had not witnessed the horror of that night. Someone who could forget the things that creep just out of sight. The things that are always watching and ever hungry. If only that man had died that night. And some new, virginal body, blessed with the gift of easy sleep, had taken his place. Never mind that though. It's pointless to ruminate on these things. I made my choice and I did so entirely on my own accord. There is no difference between myself and every other man who had walked the sleepless streets before me. We have all found the same place, because ultimately, it was the place that we were looking for, even if we did not know it. At first, I tried to deny this, but it was no use. I got nothing more or less than what I had asked for. So did Jack, so did Cornelius, so did all of us. I am part of them now, and there is no turning back. Last night, I stayed up a little late, compelled by some unknown force to take another late drive. Soon without even realizing it, I found myself turning down familiar streets. It was as if some other driver had taken the wheel and I was his passenger. I turned back before I could reach my destination, but tonight, I think I'm going to drive again. The moon is bright red, and earlier I could have sworn I saw it disappear for a moment. I am being called and there's no use in resisting. Why would I even want to? I have a journey now, shortly to go. My master calls me. I must not say no. King Lear, Act 5, Scene 3 If you couldn't tell from the title, I'm a police officer. I'm not going to say which department I work for, but I will say that it's in Massachusetts. For the sake of you all not losing your crap, trying to figure out where all this happened. I figure a little bit about myself couldn't hurt. 
For the sake of purpose, we'll say my name is Jack. No, this isn't my real name, but we'll pretend it is. I grew up wanting to be a cop my whole life. Nothing else interested me, except being a police officer. I've been a cop for almost seven years now, and I have a wife and son. I work graveyard shifts in a small, urban town, a little while from Boston. Most calls I take involve junkies tweaking out and making an ass of themselves, or petty neighbors calling about trivial stuff that we can't get involved with. Only a handful of times have I been called on things like robberies and homicides. Anyway, last night I was doing my regular patrols, waiting for dispatch to give me something to do. It was around 1.03 a.m. when dispatch chimed in my ear during my lunch break. 2.51, come in. Great timing, guys. I thought before responding. Go ahead. We have a call coming from five blocks from your location about a homeless man in his mid-fifties acting suspicious. You gotta be kidding. I thought before responding again. Copy. What's the address? She gave me the address, putting the call near an abandoned construction site, well known for being a drug and homeless hotspot. The address itself was in a poorer neighborhood that consisted of trailer trash who were trying to build their new life. I walked out of the restaurant, burger in hand, and got on my cruiser before heading off to the address. When I arrived at the situation, the lady who had made the call was on her front porch waiting for me. She was a frail old lady who looked like she had just seen a ghost. I got out of my car and I walked up to her, keeping my social distance before asking her what the problem was. In broken English, she told me that she was spoiling her grandkids with a late night kids movie when she heard something hit the side of her home. When she looked outside, she saw an old man banging his head against the wall before crawling on all fours and twitching violently. At that point, she called the police and waited for us to show up. About two minutes before I arrived, however, the suspect got up and walked in the direction of the abandoned construction site. Great, I thought, still giving the lady my full attention. Another tweaker call to add to the books. I thanked her for her cooperation and turned to head back to my car when I heard her yell. Wait! I immediately turned back around to face her. She held up a finger, saying to wait for one second before she shuffled back inside her house as fast as she could, leaving her door open. As I waited, I saw two small children, no older than ten, peek around the doorframe to see me. I gave them a warm smile and waved at them, before they quickly disappeared from my sight. I sighed and I waited a bit longer, until the old lady came back out holding a small crucifix in one hand, and a small jar of what I could only assume to be water. She came down the stairs, approaching me as I backed up, telling her that we need to keep our distance. She told me to be quiet, calling me a dumbass under her breath in Spanish, before standing right in front of me. I towered over her. Being just under six feet tall, well, she couldn't have been taller than five foot four. She held out her hand, offering me the small crucifix. It was a small carving of a cross with a crude Jesus carved into the front of it. She took my hand from my side and placed the cross inside, closing my hand into a fist. For safety, she said before opening the jar of water and sprinkling me with it while saying what I think was an old prayer in Spanish. I don't speak a whole lot of Spanish, but I do know enough to understand what she was saying. She was blessing me for safety against all evil in this world, and the next while also praying that my family comes to no harm, which I thought was a little strange, 
but I shrugged it off before thanking her and walking back to my car. As I got in, I called dispatch and told them that I was headed to the abandoned site to investigate. Do you want backup? Dispatch asked. I responded, Negative. That won't be necessary. And with that, I drove in the direction of the building, scanning for the suspect and putting the crucifix in the shirt pocket over my heart. Now, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe that religious objects can have positive effects on the mind, making you feel more calm and secure. So I figured that I was just showing respect for the old lady by putting it over my heart. I scanned the roads and sidewalks for the suspect for what felt like hours before I came upon the abandoned construction site. Originally, the building was meant to be a four-story low-income housing complex with the same layout as a hotel. After a year or two of construction, however, funding for the project was cut and it had to be abandoned even though it was nearly complete, save for the plumbing and electricity. The site has been abandoned for over five years now, and had attracted druggies and transients, or homeless if you prefer. The building was barely lit up by the light poles along the street, and the chain link fence that once kept people out was now bent and warped, allowing anyone to enter and exit as they pleased, giving it an eerie feel. Me and a couple of buddies of mine made jokes that it was the headquarters of a secret society that was plotting world domination. When I got out of my car, it wasn't the building itself that was the creepy part. It was the fact that everyone who was squatting there was outside with fear in their eyes. I turned on my body cam and approached one of the homeless people. She was a lady in her late thirties with an obvious heroin addiction, based on the apparent track marks trailing up and down her arms. I asked her what was going on, and she told me that there was a man on the third floor who nobody had ever seen before and got scared. When I asked her why she got scared, she said that she saw a few people go to talk to him before coming back and acting like they had lost their minds. I tried asking her a few more questions, but she went silent after that. I made my way through the sea of people to the man who fit my description of the original suspect from the lady's house, and I questioned him about the lady, confirming my suspicions about him being the suspect. When I had questioned him further, he told me that he didn't remember why he went to her house and banged his head. He only knew that he felt like he was instructed to do so. I gave him a citation and told him to not go back to the old lady's house again, which he agreed to. After asking a few more people about the situation, I called in to dispatch and told them to send back up to take care of everyone outside while I went in to investigate the strange man. I went back to my patrol car and retrieved my shotgun and a few spare shells before turning on my mounted flashlight, stepping over the now flattened fence, and entering the building. We had made multiple drug busts here in the past, so I was pretty familiar with the layout of everything as I swept the first floor and made my way to the interior staircase to the second floor. As I kept making my way to the third floor and sweeping the area, I kept tripping over scattered beer bottles and random stuff the people here left lying around, nearly eating it when I ran into a whole shopping cart of crap left in the middle of the hallway. I cursed under my breath, and I pushed it aside and made my way to the third floor. Once there, I swept through each room, looking for this mystery man until I came across a locked door. I found this odd because every room I checked before this one was either open or unlocked. I knocked on the door and made my presence known by calling out, Police, open up! When I got no response, I yelled that I was coming in and I kicked the door down. 
And okay, I feel like I should clarify something. Being a cop for seven years, you see some disturbing stuff. I'm not going to go into detail about what I've seen in the past, but just know that it's pretty hard to make me feel disturbed. But what I saw in that room nearly made me crap myself. The room was completely pitch black, except for a tall, skinny man sitting in the middle, staring away from me. And when I say that he was tall, I mean this dude was impossibly tall. He wore an old gray suit and his head was completely bald. If I had to guess, I would say that he looked like he was in his late 70s. I tried to illuminate the rest of the room with my flashlight, but anywhere that I shone my flashlight, the darkness had just absorbed it. I began to feel a strong, primal sense of fear as my eyes couldn't look away from the man. My knees began to shake violently, and I could feel my heart rate go through the roof. I fixed my shotgun on the man and tried to calm myself down. This son of a gun must have had eyes on the back of his head, because as soon as I did, he began to slowly stand up, only making my paralyzing fear worse as I kept my sights on him. Once he was fully standing up, he slowly turned around and faced me, and I got to see what he really looked like. I can't even begin to describe what this thing looked like, but I'll try my best, so bear with me. I called a thing because there was no way in hell that this was a human being. It was built like one, sure, but it was less of a man than it was a thing. The suit was old as heck and worn out, but it was still tight enough that I could see its bones sticking out. Its skin was light gray and was covered in burns and blisters, like it had just walked away from a nuclear explosion. And its face, hell, its damned face. The poor thing really looked like it had been born in Chernobyl. Its eyes were the size of light bulbs and were pure white with a small black dot as pupils. Its nose consisted of a triangular hole in the center of its head, and the mouth, god, just thinking about it makes me want to curl up in fear. Its mouth was massive. The mouth alone took up half of the thing's head, and the teeth. They weren't sharp and long like some messed up Stephen King monster. In fact, they were normal teeth. The problem was that it had too many. Its mouth was full of teeth and when it smiled, that's all you could see. By now my hands were shaking with the shotgun still pointing in the direction of the thing, though I couldn't tell if I would even hit anything if I had pulled the trigger. It looked me dead in the eyes with those ghostly looking eyes and it smiled. And when I say it smiled from ear to ear, I mean its smile went from ear to frickin' ear. Suddenly, through all my fear and panic, I heard it speak. Hello. Its voice sounded like that creepy YouTube video that everyone was obsessed about a few years ago. What was it called? Salad Fingers. This thing sounded like Salad Fingers with that childish British accent. I was shaking with fear at this point and wanted to run like crazy but I couldn't move. All I could do was look at this lanky thing as it spoke. It raised one of its arms and pointed at me with a long, bony finger before saying, Are you here to take me away? I had no idea what the heck to do. Before I could think of something, I had already responded to this thing. Who... who... It had finished my sentence before I could stutter it out. Who am I? It asked, tilting its head to the side. I slowly nodded before it answered my question. Nobody that you wouldn't care to know. Nobody cares to know me. 
Nobody cares about me. It trailed off, mumbling nonsense and whimpering under its breath, no longer paying me much attention. Finally, I found enough strength to snap out of my fear-induced paralysis and began backing out of the room. I probably only took two steps before the floor creaked under my weight, sending the thing to snap its head in my direction, looking at me with a look I can only describe as pure rage. This thing didn't have any lips, but I could tell that it was snarling as it shot right in front of me, putting the barrel of my shotgun directly on its lower abdomen. It was at this point that I realized that the inky darkness covering the room was coming from this thing that was now towering over me. I looked up to meet its gaze, only to see pure hatred in its eyes as it spoke once again. Don't leave me like the others did. Its voice was a mixture of hatred, desperation, and fear. I responded, No way, asshole. Before I pulled the trigger and dumped a slug into this thing's stomach, causing him to stumble backward, I quickly bolted out of the door and down the hall towards the main staircase. As I ran, I heard it scream and start slamming into walls, chasing after me. I could tell that it was pissed and it was gaining on me, but I didn't care. I was just a few feet away from the stairs, but this thing was closing the distance fast. Right before I entered the staircase, I racked my shotgun, putting another slug in the chamber, turned around and dumped another round down the hall. But when I looked down the hall, where I just shot, where I had heard this thing barreling towards me with murderous intent. There was nothing. There was no sign that anything had chased me. Was I hallucinating? Who gives a crap? I told myself, let's just get out of here before we find out. Not giving it a second thought, I raced back down the stairs and out of the building where I was met with multiple squad cars and officers looking intently at me. The next few hours are a blur, but I do remember having to talk with paramedics and telling other officers about what had happened on the third floor. Naturally, nobody believed me, and when we reviewed my body cam, we found that I had turned the dang thing off by accident halfway through my sweep of the building, so there is no real proof of what I had seen other than the testimony of a few tweakers. I was put on sick leave for the next three days to regain my thoughts, and I got sent home early, being told not to worry about writing a report. When I got home, it was roughly 3.20 a.m., so I made my way up to my room, where I was met with my wife sleeping soundly, before quietly taking off my uniform to change into sweatpants and a shirt. As I took off my shirt, I noticed that the crucifix the old lady had given me was missing from where it sat, over my heart. I shrugged it off as me just losing it in my car, or somewhere else and I got in bed with my wife. She shifted slightly before falling back asleep, to which I followed her into the world of unconsciousness. When I woke up the next morning, I immediately hugged my wife and son before telling my wife everything that had happened last night. She didn't believe my story but she said that she believed that I believed it. Whatever, it's not like I need anyone to believe me anyway. I know what I saw and that's good enough for me. A little later in the day, I was helping my wife tidy up her room when I came across something sitting on top of our dresser. It was the crucifix. I thought that maybe my wife had found it on the floor and left it here for me. But there was a note next to it. When I opened it and read what was inside, I became overwhelmed with the same fear I had felt when I first saw that damn thing. Inside was four simple words, but they held horrific meaning that makes me fear for my family's safety and caused me to write this in the first place. Please, don't leave me. Yeah. 
There were countless accidents that took place in the former Soviet Union, but they were all kept silent. Just like entire cities all over the country were top secret on account of the research going on at them. This is the story of one of them. In the late 1970s, I was stationed at a facility several thousand kilometers outside of Leningrad. I was in charge of overseeing the security for the facility, which was classified as top secret. I had been approved for the job not only because I was a party member, but I had family connections in Moscow. As such, I reported to Moscow. The facility itself was dull and unremarkable on the outside, but that was just the tip of the iceberg, as you say, for it went several stories deep underground, which was where the top secret part happened. That was where the top medical experts and biologists from the Academy of Sciences conducted research and experiments. This was when scientists were among the most revered members of society. They had put a man into space and constructed the atom bomb. There were no heights that they could not scale. The events of April 1986 would put an eternal blemish on that idea in the public's mind. But I lost my faith in them on the day of August 30th, 1979. I had just arrived at work when I was summoned by Dr. Petrov, the director of the facility. The guards at the various checkpoints had weighed me through as usual, but otherwise, it was empty. According to Petrov, there had been some accident during the night, and while he assured me that everything was under control, he was under orders from the Ministry of Health to place the area under lockdown. All non-essential personnel had been told to stay home or not to come in by the shift chief. This had happened before, so I was not alarmed in any way. Petrov seemed to be his normal self, but I noticed that he was perspiring quite a bit when he lit a cigarette. I thought I noticed what looked like a bandage on his arm under his lab coat. Everything is under control, Vasily Alexander. Just a precaution, he said before turning out of his office and heading towards the elevator that went straight to the underground labs and offices. I went the opposite way in the direction of my office. When I arrived, I noticed my aide, Nicola, was not at his desk. Unusual, but not unheard of. Most likely, he had been sent home as well. So I busied myself with the usual security reports, letters and memos, and other matters that I always try to take care of early in the day. I was accompanied by my typical amount of cigarettes and coffee. It was almost lunchtime when the phone started buzzing. The phone, as in the special red phone on the corner of my desk that connects me to both the secure lines underground and to my superiors in Moscow. From the button lighting up on the phone's console, the call was coming from underground. Yes? There was silence on the other end of the line. Hello? Still nothing. Is there a problem? I heard something that sounded like a grunt or a wheeze that was followed by a loud clattering noise. But in the background, I distinctively heard the sound of a person screaming before it immediately stopped. Dr. Petrov. When there was no further response, I hung up, left my office, and walked quickly towards the facility's atrium, where two army guards were usually on duty there. Today was no exception, as both Viktor and Anatoly were at their normal posts outside of the front. What's going on below? I asked, ignoring the usual pleasantries. I am not aware of anything aside from what Dr. Petrov informed me, Comrade Ivanov. Is there a problem? Anatoly asked, clearly confused. I received a call in my office a few moments ago. The secure line. No answer, but it sounded like something was happening. I heard a person screaming. We've heard nothing out of the ordinary all morning, 
In fact, no sign of anything. I paused for a moment, deep in thought. All right, Victor, you come with me. We're going down there. Anatoly, stay here. And if we don't return immediately, contact our superiors and inform them something is wrong. He nodded without saying a word. Turning to face Victor, I continued. I'll be right back. There's something that I need from my office first. Without another word, I went back upstairs, took off my suit jacket, and opened the bottom drawer of my desk, and took the pistol that I had plenty of experience using, but never fired on the job in the holster it came with. I put the holster on, and made sure the gun was ready to go and loaded before sliding it into said holster. Carefully putting my suit jacket back on, I returned to the atrium. Alright, let's go, was all I said to Victor before I entered the code into the elevator. We stood in the secure, windowless block for what seemed like an eternity. I didn't say a word to Victor who had a distinguished career in the army, and like everyone else at the facility, had ties to powerful people in Moscow. This was one of the most revered medical research facilities in the Soviet Union. Everything was top of the line, so I couldn't imagine what the problem was. The elevator eventually stopped at the underground section, the doors opening silently. When it did, Victor and I gazed at the vast, climate-controlled corridor with both awe and panic. Several doctors and other personnel, among the most distinguished in the Union, were lying motionless on the ground. All had suffered some injury and had blood on the ground, but some had pieces of flesh ripped from their body and were marked by what looked like bite marks from an animal attack. My stomach lurched as I stepped carefully into the corridor, Victor behind me. With one hand resting nervously on my gun, I stepped around the bodies of what had once been my colleagues. What? What happened? I managed to ask him. I don't know. I looked back and saw that the normally calm and unaffected Belarusian looked pale. I've never seen anything like this. I haven't either. We kept on, trekking through the vast labyrinth of hallways, corridors, labs, offices, and other rooms. But we found no other bodies aside from the ones right near the secure elevator. Each step that we made seemed far too loud in the underground corridors. I suddenly felt the sense of being boxed in how the whole area was silently packed in on every side by layers of dirt. There was no telling how much time had passed, but after what seemed like hours, we turned a corridor and found what looked to be an operating room. But what got my attention was the figure in the lab coat huddled on the opposite side of the room, back turned to us. Dr. Petrov, I asked. The figure turned, and it was Dr. Petrov, or at least it looked like him. His previously ruddy skin had turned to deathly pale, and his eyes were glassy and empty. I also noticed that his lab coat was stained with blood on the arm, where I had thought there was a bandage earlier. But the most striking thing was the walk. He shuffled towards us like a drunkard, arms outstretched like he was reaching for something. Dr. Petrov, I said louder. He didn't answer, but emitted some pained moan. He got closer and closer to us. I wasn't sure what exactly to do, but instinct took over, and I knew that we had to get out of there. Run, I yelled at Victor, and he immediately scrambled out of the room. I was right behind him, feeling what had previously been Dr. Petrov lumbering behind me, and I slammed the door just as his arms were reaching out to grab me. 
I pushed all of my weight against the door, as Petrov clumsily tried to force it open. I frantically looked around for something to block it. There was nothing in the hallway here. It was all climate controlled, sanitized, and secure. Here, Victor ran back with some massive metal instrument that he shoved in the stainless steel door handle. Because the door opened inward, Petrov could not force his way out. The door rattling made me nervous, but it was secure, at least for now. Let's go, Victor said. I followed without saying a word, and we quickly went back the way that we came. My heart was pounding in my chest as we walked. Each time we turned a corridor or passed a new room, I was terrified at what or who we would see. But each time, it was nothing. We were almost at the elevator when it stopped. Victor and I were walking past the hallway when we heard something. The sound of movement coming closer towards us. As we both turned, we saw Alexei Porovich, a distinguished biologist, running towards us. His medical garb saturated with blood. He looked like his usual self, apart from the terror in his eyes. Get to the elevator now! He screamed. As I was doing just that, I saw what he was running from. A sea of people who moved and looked just like Petrov. All gray limbs, dead eyes and bleeding wounds. A medley of groans. They lumbered after Alexei like a wounded animal which I suppose is what they were. They weren't dead, but they didn't look living either. Victor and I sprinted to the elevator, the sound of the pursuing Alexei growing louder in the space. After a furious press of the button, we paused for a moment, unsure of what to do. I'll go take a look. I'll tell you when to press the button. I heard myself say, before I stepped out into the corridor just outside of the elevator. When I did, there was still no sign of Alexei. I took a deep breath, trying to calm my heart, which was pounding far too loud for comfort. After an eternity, Alexei rounded a corner, but just as I was relieved to see him, he tripped and fell, and those pursuing him were almost on him. Without a conscious thought, I felt my gun being taken out of its holster, and the sounds of it being fired echoed off the reinforced walls. Several people trying to grab Alexei were hit. Some stumbled and fell, others merely paused, while others fell and lay still. Regardless, I kept firing, and it was enough for Alexei to escape unharmed. When he was almost inside of the elevator, I yelled, Press it! Before stepping inside myself. Alexei had just made it inside the doors when they closed, and we began the slow ascent to the surface. As we did, I could hear these shuffling sounds and moans just outside the metal doors. Victor leaned against the wall and ran a hand through his hair. I took a similar pose while Alexei's legs gave out completely, and he slumped on the elevator floor. The sound of heavy breathing filled the elevator. What happened? I said to the technician once he caught his breath. I, I don't know. We had received a specimen from Moscow late in the night. Top secret. A body given to us for study. We thought that it was dead, but it wasn't. It bit several of the staff who were quarantined down here. They were fine for a while, but they became infected and bit others just like they had been. Eventually, the entire staff working underground got it. I'm the only one who didn't because I was on a cigarette break when it happened. I didn't say a word, and when we returned to the surface, we found out Anatoly had done what we had asked. Victor and I informed our superiors what we had seen, and Alexei told a story in detail to the security services. We were all closely interrogated 
and examined for contamination. There was never any formal conclusion of what had happened, nor did we ever get the full version of events. But we all received a decoration and a promotion for our troubles. The army was called in and somehow, they took care of those contaminated. The families of Dr. Petrov and the others afflicted were informed that there had been an accident. For their troubles, they were all posthumously awarded the highest decorations of the Soviet Union and honored as heroes. The facility was quickly abandoned and sealed off soon after the incident, where it sits alone and forgotten, like so many others. There are certain things you just can't forget. You must have seen those clips of old musicians deep in the grips of Alzheimer's who spring to life when they hear an old tune, suddenly able to find the correct keys on the piano, even when they can't remember their own name. For my grandfather, it was languages. He might not remember much, might not be able to tell an old friend from her nurse, but if you spoke to him in French or Italian, Mandarin or Arabic, he replied fluently without missing a beat even if it was just to ask where he was, or who you were. I don't know quite how many languages he actually knew. It must have been upwards of a dozen, easily. He couldn't write all too well, but something in his mind meant words and their meanings that just came easy to him. I was trying to record his talent on the day that he died. I had no idea that it would happen but I thought it might be a nice way for our family to remember him. I had learnt a few phrases in about 15 different languages and had them written down in a small book, phonetically, so that there was no way that I would make a mistake. It was the same day Artie decided to show up. My grandfather's old best friend, a man my father only vaguely remembered, but it was mentioned in my grandfather's journals over and over again, until he stopped writing. Artie was tall, very tall, and had to stoop to enter the room, which meant his coat, which was dripping wet, left a thin film of water on the doorframe. He was soaked to the bone, even the hair under his hat. My father made a limp joke. Caught in the rain. Something like that. He seemed a little younger than my grandfather, but that was to be expected. Artie could still walk, and my grandfather had survived on a diet of neat whiskey and cigarettes for his whole life. The two were practically night and day. Artie had this way about him, this neatness and even the most basic movements. The way he moved reminded me of origami, it seemed that every movie made, he was folding more and more of himself. He was constantly folding into the next moment, and the next. He didn't say anything to my grandfather. Instead, gave him space and sat in a chair in the corner, and had a hushed conversation with my father as I started up my recording. My grandfather was fairly lucid that day, and although he had a lot of questions, he was amiable not scared, and I could see him get excited whenever we changed languages. We made our way from English to French, through Europe via Germany and Italy, through Arabic and Mandarin, and I was about to start in the more obscure languages when my grandfather began to cough, a deep wet cough that started in his stomach and then stuck in his throat. The machine next to him started making all sorts of strange noises, a rhythmic buzzes and beeps at a frantic pace, and my father stood up and went straight to the bed, holding his hand and speaking to him softly, and Artie stood up and walked over, going for my father's other hand. I didn't know what to do. I had never been in a situation like this, and I sat in a stunned silence as the nurses entered and tried to calm everyone down. 
tried to calm him down. Trying to give him some selection of pills, but there was nothing they could do. My grandfather seemed possessed. He sat up, retching some of the tubes and wires out of the wall, hands and body shaking, and began to speak, facing straight ahead, in a language that was unlike anything I had ever heard. It sounded like two languages at once, contradicting sounds fighting different patterns so that words would seem to be spoken partially on an in-breath. It was like his mouth and tongue were spasming against each other. The words were alien, but the tone was clear. Something was wrong. He kept going for a while, clutching my father's hand, eyes wide. Whatever he was speaking, getting faster and faster and faster, until he seemed to tire himself out. With a low moan, he lay back and took his last rattling breath. People say that grief fills your every waking moment, takes up whole weeks and months, years even. They're wrong. Grief empties your life. Empties your life until there's nothing left but staring down the barrel of another week with this. With this weight on your chest and this absence in your life. And every day feels like it stretches on and on and on forever. Without them. Which is maybe why I became so obsessed with the recording. I know it's a little morbid, maybe even virgin on insensitive. But I couldn't get that language out of my head. My father had called it nonsense. Artie had just shrugged it off as if to say, no clue. And from the pain in my father's eyes... I had decided not to mention it again. He didn't need this. Not now. I tried phonetically typing out words from it online, but that didn't come up with anything. I tried listening to recordings of hundreds of languages on various databases, but none sounded anything like it. There was something about the way the language made the mouth work against itself, like you were trying to swallow every word you spoke that made it sound like no other language I could find. The more I thought about it, the more I thought about why he had been speaking it. It was like something had shocked him, like he had seen something, and it had all come pouring out, like a bursted pipe. I thought about Artie. He and my grandfather had stopped speaking a long, long time ago. I knew that much. I knew that they had been thick as thieves, had been through some shit as my father tactfully put it one evening. Artie had appeared almost out of nowhere, looking to reconnect with my grandfather, and we had been more than happy to oblige. Thought maybe they could put it all to rest at last. It was one of my grandfather's biggest regrets, the way that he and Artie had parted. Unfortunately, we never got that far. But I wondered if Artie knew something about the language my grandfather was speaking. I found a contact number for Artie's family, tucked away in an old address book, and I made the call. To my surprise, it went through. A woman's voice answered, sounded around my age, tired. Yeah. Hi there. Sorry. I know this is strange, but I'm Alan Voynich's grandson, Max. My grandfather was a friend of your grandfather's. I was wondering if I could speak to Artie. You're a Voynich. She spat on my surname like it was made of dirt, paused before continuing. It's bold of you to call. You of all family should know. You can't speak to Artie. Not anymore. I didn't understand the hostility. I was confused. Artie had seemed in a good place when we had seen him. Sure, there had been something strange about him, but I thought whatever had happened between them was in the past. Sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. Let's start again. What's your name? She was reluctant, but replied, Amy. Amy, look. I met Artie a couple of weeks ago. He was there when my grandfather passed. I know there was some history between them. 
but he seemed like he wanted to fix it. I just want to ask him a couple of questions. For closure. There was silence on the other end. Just five minutes of his time. I think you would appreciate it. She cut me off. What the heck do you think you're doing? How dare you? Is this some sort of joke? A prank? Do you have any respect? I tried to interject, to explain myself, but she continued. I never knew my grandfather, Max. Artie died before I was born. A beat and then... Go F yourself. I didn't sleep well that night. There was a storm and I dreamt of a figure in the rain. Tall and pale, soaked to the bone, making its way towards me. I dreamt of rivers and canals and wells overflowing with dirty gray water. In my half-sleep, I could hear the language, the contradictory sounds that it was comprised of, and the sound of the rain against my window, and the gurgling of the pipes in the walls. When morning came, there was a small puddle at the bottom of my bedroom door, and the door frame was dripping wet. It must have had a leak. I didn't want to think of the alternative. I didn't mention any of this to anyone. I didn't think that it would help anything. What would it accomplish? My father was dealing with his own private grief, and the rest of my family were too. Maybe there had been a mistake. Maybe the man had been Artie's son or a relative and we had misunderstood. Part of me knew that that wasn't true. And so I became more obsessed with discovering this language. As each time I remembered the scene I had recorded, it became clearer and clearer in my mind that my grandfather was speaking to Artie, that he was desperately trying to communicate something, and that it was so urgent he used his last breath to do it. I became obsessed with the recording, and that's to put it mildly. I spent my days in the library, pouring through books on linguistics, on the foundations of language, studying histories of forgotten languages. Maybe I just needed something to fill my time. Sometimes I felt watched, and I would think that I could catch phrases or strains of the language in the dripping of taps, or the sound of tires running through puddles. It was outside the library that I found an answer though. Not the answer, but an answer nonetheless. I was chaining cigarettes, sheltering under a huge tree behind the library, listening to the recording out loud. I hadn't been sleeping well, and nightmares and all that, and so I often forgot things. Headphones, for example. I looked up to see a figure shambling towards me. As it got closer, I could recognize a few features. A tattered coat, missing teeth, a big smile. Dot. Everyone knew Dot. He had spent his life battling a heroin addiction and losing. And you could find him on any given day, wandering the main streets in town, looking for a bit of change or a smoke. Spare a smoke, Max. I flashed him a small smile and held out the pack. I was listening to the last 10 seconds, trying to work out what the change in tone indicated. Had it been a question, some bizarre form of syntax. I was so deep in my own head that I almost didn't hear Dot speak up. Why is a boy like you listening to Gutter? I shook my head. I thought he had this confused for some sort of experimental music. It's not a band or anything, Dot. Sorry. He looked a little offended. I know what it is. Gutter. What's a boy like you listening to Gutter for? My heart laughed. He had a name for it? He knew what this was. Dot, what do you mean, Gutter? I've been trying to find out what this is for weeks. There is no records of it. He looked at my pack of cigarettes, shrugged. Rolling my eyes, I gave him another, which he stashed behind his ear. Every homeless knows gutter. Every crook, too. 
but there's no records. He laughed. Wouldn't be. Not the kind of thing you keep a record of. It's a dirty language. The recording was playing quietly on loop, and we could both hear the faint sounds of gutter coming from my phone speaker. Dot continued. See how it sounds like his throat's being crushed? Just a little. Sounds like he's got two tongues. I nodded. Gutter's two languages in one. It means one thing to some folk, one thing to others. What's the distinction? Dodd paused, taking the second cigarette from behind his ear and lighting it, sucking on it for a long time, until I could hear the tip sizzle. The rain was falling harder now, lashing the earth and the brick walls behind us. They say it's if you kill a man. Something changes up here, he tapped his head, and you can just hear it different. Killing changes a man in more ways than one. Another long drag. It's used by all the wrong sorts to communicate. I guess you can't fake killing someone. It's not too popular though, seeing as it makes it fairly obvious the reason you're speaking it in the first place. Which version can you understand? Dot held up his hands and turned them over in the dim light. No blood on these. Can you understand anything that he's saying in the recording? Dot strained to listen for a while and then shook his head. It doesn't make much sense in the gutter that I know. Nonsense phrases. And then Dot spoke slowly as if he was translating what he could hear my father saying. The well goes deep, and deeper still. Shit like that. Nonsense. I frowned. This all began to feel dark. Like there were histories buried here, and I didn't want to explore. Bones I didn't want to dig up. Warnings that I had missed. But I couldn't stop now. I was so close and I knew now that this all meant something. My stomach turned. The rain began to find a strange rhythm, like footsteps. Footsteps that grew closer with each beat of the wind. You should stay away from the gutter, boy. Forget about this. Somewhere in the distance, a car alarm started. Doc continued as if to himself. Dirty language, he spat. You know what they say about gutter? I didn't. There's only two occasions in his life a good man should speak gutter. If he's bargaining for his life. Dot turned and looked straight at me. Or for his soul. Me and Dot didn't talk for a while after that. It's a heavy thing. A man's soul. It weighs on your mind even after you finish talking about it. But I couldn't help a thought that slowly crawled into my mind. The urge to know about Gutter. About my grandfather. About my family. Dot, you don't happen to know anyone who speaks Gutter, do you? I mean, the other type. Dot stared at his feet. You sure you want to do this, Max? People who speak real gutter, they're not like you or me. There's a stain on their souls, somewhere. It's a dirty language. I had to. The question seemed to get bigger and bigger the more that I thought about it. I had to know. The first rumblings of thunder rolled in with the rain, and even our shelter under the tree was beginning to leak. Through the silhouette of the branches, I could make out streetlights, shadows moving, a sense that this storm was hiding something. The rustling of the leaves turned into an organic chatter above us. I'm sure, Dot. He let out a long sigh, and I offered him another cigarette. You're just like your father. You know that. Stubborn as a mule. The difficulty is, it's not cheap to find. Sure, I know a few people, but... 
How much? A hundred now. A hundred after would do the trick. I couldn't help but smile. Sure. At this point, I was so desperate, I would have paid far more. I had the money on me. In fact, that had been something my grandfather had taught me. I remember him telling me when I was just a boy. Always keep enough on you for a train out of town and a room for the night. And I listened. I thought about other pieces of advice he had offered me over the years. He always spoke to me like I was an adult. I remember when I was 13 and I had hurt my neighbor John. When he had pushed the game too far and something inside of me had snapped. I knocked him over and stamped on his hand until his fingers broke. And I didn't realize his hand was on a rock. Honest. I thought it was mud and he was screaming because he was scared. I remember how the guilt had turned me inside out, bit by bit. Starting with my stomach, and then my lungs and my face had flushed and... I had said sorry so many times it was like it was the only word that I knew. I remember him sitting down next to me, seeing how angry I was at myself, and I was trying to understand how I had done something so bad. I remember thinking of all the stories that I had loved, of how the good guys had never did anything like this, never hurt their friends so bad if they went to the hospital, and thought that I would never be able to be like them again. I thought that if I was the protagonist of a film, everyone would stop watching here. They would turn to each other and say, we don't want him to win. And just as I had felt like this, a new feeling was going to swallow me alive. He said, this is how it feels. This is how it'll feel if you do it again. There are two souls in every man, Max. Life's just finding out which one's in charge. Dodd pulled me from my daydream. I'm off. Suddenly, I've got plans for my evening. He waved these small bundle of notes in my face. Give me your number. I'll call if I find anything. It shouldn't take long. He offered me a tattered notebook, and I had to hunch over it to stop the occasional drop of rain making the ink run. I had to flick through a few pages of strange sketches, bees, butterflies, moss, all in the same shaky hand. He took the book back and we stood for a while, looking at these sheets of rain from under the tree, working out when to take the plunge. His eyes seemed to be focused on something else, as if he was tracking something moving out there. For a second, he lost his warm exterior and seemed very old and I could see that he hadn't lived this long by accident, and that he knew things most men didn't. Knew things that most men didn't have to find out. He didn't face me when he spoke again. Be careful out there tonight, boy. Water's rising. And with that, he was off into the rain, pulling his coat over his head and leaping over puddles. I made my way back home, hugging the buildings and trees to stay out of the rain. The cold was beginning to seep through my clothes and into my skin, nipping at exposed flesh. As I approached my house, I could see a figure stood outside, arms wrapped around themselves to keep warm. My heart skipped a beat. Who? Why? They were directly outside my front gate, moving to and fro. The rain had turned into a thin mist, which obscured my vision slightly. But as soon as I saw the figure, they saw me too, and marched straight up to me, immediately shouting. But their words were stolen by the wind. I could see the face of a young woman, a mad bird's nest of hair thrown about by the wind. And as she got closer, I could make out small clips of what she was saying. What the hell are you playing at? Such anger so quickly threw me off guard, and for a few seconds, I was lost for words, stood in the street, stammering. You and your family, what do you think you're doing? My ma saw him yesterday, stood in a puddle, just watching our house. Is this a joke? 
She's inconsolable. Is that funny to you? I tried to reply, but there were so many questions my mouth couldn't make the words. I know it's not a joke. This is bad. Bad. I can make out a tattoo that covered her neck. A moth that would seem to vibrate whenever she shouted, like it was fluttering around a candle. It's Amy. She stood for a second, looking me up and down and shaking her head, like telling me her name warranted a bigger response. Are you going to invite me in? I mumbled an apology, said that she didn't look how I'd expected, and to which she replied, What the heck did you expect? And that shut me up until we were in my hallway. We were both soaked to the skin, and she was shivering now, although trying to hide it by clenching her jaw. I spoke up. What's this about, Amy? Last time we spoke, you didn't seem to be my biggest fan. She cut me off. I'm not. Did you pay for this house? I hadn't. In fact, it had been left to me by my grandfather. But I thought it was best not to mention that. I shook my head. I thought so. Look, my ma saw him, Artie, by her house. She hasn't left her room since. You said you saw him when your grandfather passed away. Yeah. He appeared the day that he passed. I was going to mention Gutter, mention the fact I think my grandfather was trying to tell Artie something, but I stopped short. I didn't trust her yet. She was, in all honesty, a total stranger. A stranger who had barged their way into my house and berated me for things I had no control over. Look, Amy, she cut me off again, but this time with a clear, crisp, shh. When she spoke, it was in a low whisper. Is your house always this wet? I looked around. I hadn't actually noticed it at first. So caught up in whatever was going on with Amy, this tiny angry woman with an ink black throat who had suddenly appeared in the storm, that I had failed to notice that my whole house was dripping wet. There was water coating the walls. Tiny beads that would occasionally pull into a large drop that would roll down the paint. The carpets were damp, a slightly darker color than usual, and the inside of the windows were peppered with condensation. I must have left a window open. She shook her head. I frowned, and in the silence, I heard a sound like running water coming from upstairs, and the floorboards gave a creak. A single drop fell into my nose, and then there was the water sound again, but this time it was deeper. The sounds isolated. It sounded like a voice. There was another creak in the floorboards, and I felt my heartbeat quicken. I caught my reflection in the window. When had I got so pale, so tall, unless... We need to go. There is a tone of real urgency in her voice, and a hint of fear, just straining the vocal cords, clipping her vowels. Now. She didn't need to say any more, and so we went, back out into the mist, her leading and me following behind, having to jog a little to keep up. She spoke as we walked through the empty streets, the only noise, the occasional peel of tires on tarmac. Our grandfathers were not good men, Max. She stared ahead, took a right. They did bad things, often. I noticed that she walked with a slight limp, making her right shoulder stoop ever so slightly. And if he's back, that means that there are more bad things to come. You don't have to talk to me like a child, you know. She stopped dead in her tracks, turned to look at me, and smiled to herself. Right. I don't want that thing that's claiming to be my grandfather coming anywhere near my family. Understand? And I can be pretty sure you don't want it near yours. She started walking again. I caught my reflection in puddles in the shop front as we passed, 
obscured by the wind and rain. I was sure that I hadn't been that pale last time I checked, that it hadn't been long enough, and my eyes, whenever I caught them, were always fixed straight back at me, as if my reflection had been watching until I caught it. We started to leave town. Where are we going? Out. We walked for a little longer in silence. We were coming up to the river. It had swollen completely in the storm, and had swamped the fields around it, even going so far as to fill the car park, and we could make out half a red ford under a faltering streetlight. The bridge was up ahead, and we both tried to speed up slightly as we crossed it. It was a good foot or two above the running water, but being suspended above it made me feel vulnerable. I could hear it. The river. I made the mistake of peering off the edge, and saw for the first time my unbroken reflection. The lights along the bridge provided a sort of clarity to the image, and I could see a pale figure, not me, not Artie, something that was trying so hard to look human, with thin features and reptilian eyes, something that smiled as it saw me notice it. And as I watched in mute horror, it lifted its hands and made it come here motion, and under the surface I could make out other faces, other limbs, moving like weeds, tangling and grasping, fingers that almost broke the surface, and I realized that what I thought was a reflection maybe wasn't, and perhaps something was lying there, hidden under the surface until now, until the flood and that maybe this thing had been lurking behind my image in every reflection, in the glass and the puddles in the river, just waiting for me to take a step closer. Max! She said my name the way she had said it the first time, like it tasted like dirt. I hurried on, trying to shake the image from my mind. For a moment, just a moment, the water had seemed so inviting, they say that when you drown, after the initial struggle, there's a moment of euphoria. People who've survived report a moment of bliss as the water rushes into their lungs. Maybe it's that the lack of oxygen in the brain stimulates some sort of emotional response. Maybe it's something else. But I don't want to find out. We made it to a small cabin on the very edge of town, and Amy let me in. There is a small kitchen with a sofa and a bed in the back. I couldn't go so far as calling it open plan, as I got the feeling that this was built before the concept of open plan was even a thing. She nodded to a blanket on the floor. That's for you. We didn't say much more as we got into our separate beds. She toweled off privately in the toilet, but I could still hear her shivering in the dark. Just before I drifted off to sleep, she spoke up. Did you see anything on the bridge? I thought for a while, considered pretending to be asleep. No. A pause. Me neither. In my dreams, I tried to stay away from mirrors and failed. The next day, I awoke to 15 missed calls. Shit, I didn't have the number saved, but it couldn't have been anyone but Dot. Shit, shit, shit. I stumbled up, necked a cup of coffee which was lukewarm on the counter. Amy was nowhere to be seen. The place was a tip. It smelled like cigarettes and sawdust. I made my way outside to see her sat on a stump, chewing her nails. This was Artie's place. Ma wouldn't come back after he died. My dad used to sneak over when she was away with me and my brother. I said nothing. I didn't have anything to say. I made a move to leave, turned to say something before I left. I'm off. I have to see someone. It's important. She looked at me for a while. In the morning light, her features seemed softer more forgiving. She finished chewing a nail and spat it out, and then spat again. 
Who? A friend. I'll come. I didn't have the energy to protest. I tried calling Dot back over and over again as we walked, and each time it went straight to voicemail. Each time I tried again. Who's this friend? I shook my head. Long story. Whatever Dot had been trying to tell me, we realized quickly on hitting the main street that we were never going to find out. There is a bunch of police tape stretched between streetlights and the glint of fluorescent jackets. Police. Shit. We pushed through the crowd that had gathered, working our way to the front. There is an ambulance and two paramedics crouched over something. Someone. This was Dot's usual spot. A little doorway in front of a shop that he was pretty friendly with, where he had spent most nights. Somewhere safe and warm and dry where he would make no trouble. He would leave at first light and clean up after himself. The figure. Dot. I tried to explain to the police that I knew him, that I needed to make sure that he was okay. His look told me all that I needed to know. Dead. I tried asking how and when, thinking that maybe it was an overdose, and perhaps selfishly, that this was maybe my fault. That with the money Dot had been able to buy more dope than he had been used to, that when he had finally found a withered little vein between his toes, he blasted it with enough heroin to kill a horse. But the police wouldn't budge. Amy watched, still chewing her nail. And just as I was beginning to get frustrated, she stepped in. She said something quietly to the policeman, something that I couldn't quite make out. And for a second, his eyes had glazed over. He shook his head as if zoning back in from a daydream, and he lifted the tape for us. Right this way. I looked at her, raised an eyebrow. She gave a half smile. I don't think she was particularly happy about helping me. The policeman called out to the medics. They're all good, don't worry. When I saw Dot, I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from making a noise. It wasn't an overdose. His body was bloated, his features distorted and swollen, as if he had drowned. His skin looked clammy, and his hair was in ragged, wet strands on the pavement around him. His eyes bulged, and as the paramedics tried to maneuver him onto the stretcher, water dribbled from his open mouth. Even his stomach was bloated, stretching the wet fabric of his shirt so that you could see his skin between the buttons. A medic sighed as he came up behind us, spoke with the cold detachment of years of experience, or with little guard for the homeless. The poor guy managed to drown in a puddle. It must have been high as a kite. I wish I could have believed him, but I could see Dot's doorway. It was bone dry. We said little for the next hour or so. I was still trying to process it all. Bizarrely, I began to appreciate Amy's company a little. She didn't speak much, left me alone to deal with this, ordered us both coffee when I was too mute to reply. I finally spoke up. Gutter. He was finding me someone who knew this language. Well, I guess two languages. Gutter. It was going to help with... Max. I looked at her. I can speak it. I shook my head. It was a nice sentiment, but she probably didn't know the full extent. Probably had learned it here or there when she fell in with the wrong crowd, and had no idea of the second hidden language. I elaborated. There are two languages that use the same words, I think. A lot of people can speak the first. The second is harder, apparently. There are certain things, nasty things you have to do. And without that, you can't understand the second part. Max, I know there are two gutters. I looked at Amy, and for a second, 
I could tell that a memory was playing across her vision. She flinched, slightly, and bit her lip. I can speak both. Amy furrowed her brow and scribbled some more notes on a pad of paper in front of her. She had been listening for a while, trying to decode both gutters, trying to understand my grandfather's last words. She looked up at me, and for a second I thought that I could see tears, but she blinked and they disappeared. They loved each other very much, our grandfathers. She bit her lip. It's hard to translate all of it. Gutter has two meanings, two languages inhabiting the same space, and so much of what's actually communicated is the contrast between the two. Does that make sense? I nodded. It did, sort of. But he starts by saying he's very, very sorry. He apologizes for everything. For Paris, for Beijing, for Alex and for Nancy, for the circus, for Artie's bad leg and everything that came after. And he says that he's so tired, that he's so tired that he can feel it in his bones, and that he wants to go. Wants to go so bad, some days that he can't get out of bed, but that he also wants to stay. Wants to see you grow old, Max. Wants to see you become a father. He says he feels like there's a war inside of him. She takes a breath. But most of all, he says that he's sorry for the well. What happened at the well? He says he regrets that more than anything else. She looked at her paper, and I saw that she had not only taken notes but also had drawn a small diagrams, a body shape split in two. I don't suppose your grandfather told you much about what we believe happens when you die. I shook my head. We? Who's we? I think she could see my confusion, because she indicated to the moth on her neck and some sketches on the paper and rolled her eyes. If anything, that only made it more confusing. I don't have time to explain all of it, but there are a few things that seem important. She paused and chewed at the end of her pen. He didn't tell you anything. I remembered his lessons, all of the words of wisdom that he had passed on to me, but nothing explicitly related to this. I started a response, trying to mumble out something, but she cut me off. Right, look. We believe that when your time comes, those that you've wronged the most come to take you to judgment. Whether that's outside the pearly gates, or meeting Anubis, or crossing the river Styx, whatever. Whoever you've wronged most is there to speak on your behalf. I was following so far. That would explain Artie. I didn't want to interject though, and suffer another withering look. So, I kept quiet, looking engaged. But it's not entirely hopeless. Our souls are composed of two parts, broadly speaking. It's a little more complicated, but look. I felt for a second that she thought that I was stupid. The better part of you is responsible for taking any souls that might have wronged you to judgment. And the worst. It manifests itself as ghosts, poltergeists, things that go bump in the night, but usually only for a short amount of time, until it just sort of wears itself out. You can't survive on hatred alone. So Artie will just disappear. Well, no. Whatever it is, I don't think that thing's entirely my grandfather. There's something else. I don't know what, though. Your grandfather doesn't mention it. He just talks about a deal and a mistake, and something that dreams below the hills. What do we do? There was no reply. We sat for a while in the cabin. Amy made coffee, and we drank it in shared silence. There is a lot to think on, after all. I had so many questions I almost didn't know where to start. 
and my head instead had churned up broken images. I saw Artie sitting in the corner of the room watching my grandfather. I saw Dot walking towards me in the rain, saw his bloated corpse. I saw Amy, the ink black of her throat, the roll of her eyes, the gap in her teeth, her limp. Part of me wanted to keep her a secret, as if admitting her to the world was somehow dangerous. I saw these separate parts of my soul, forced together and bound with a bone in my chest. I saw a cave made from stone so black and wet it acted as a mirror. I heard the burbling of the stream running through it, and I knew the way the water was a tongue in the dark. The images began to come faster, more and more fragmented. I saw the back of Amy's head, slick with water. Blood? Small leather books in a heap on a wooden floor. A stag's horns emerging from a black leg. My phone buzzed on the table and pulled me into the present moment. The screen cast a sterile light on the wood, forcing my eyes to adjust. I didn't realize how dark it had got. I made a face to Amy and she shrugged, as if to say, who cares? I picked it up, my aunt. I didn't see her in nearly five years, which immediately made alarm bells ring, and I only had her number for obligatory birthday calls. She had never been close to the family, spending time in various institutions, stealing from my father and my grandfather, losing her mind slowly to drinking drugs and bad genetics. She was old now, older than my father, and the first seeds of dementia were beginning to bloom in her mind their roots slowly worming their way into her memories. Sometimes I would receive two or three birthday calls on the day itself, and would have the same conversation each time. Max? Hey, Auntie. Amy raised an eyebrow. I'm just calling you to pass on a note. I heard a sound like she was fumbling with glasses, unfolding a piece of paper. Artie swung by earlier. Do you remember Artie? Him and my father were so close, Max. So close, he was practically family. She paused for a moment. I could almost hear her, her brain searching itself, unable to compute the memory and the reality at once. Anyway, Artie, he came over and stopped for a chat. He told me to tell you that he'll be seeing you soon, Max. He said that it was very important, that I must make sure that I tell you that he'd be seeing the both of you soon, and that he would finish what they started. He didn't say much more. I felt my chest tighten, and Amy must have seen something in my face. Some pain or fear flashed across it because she suddenly jotted something down and spun the pad around. What? My aunt spoke again, this time with a tone in her voice that reminded me of being a child as if what she was telling me was at once obvious and important, an instruction that I must obey whether I understood it or not. He was insistent, Max. It sounded important. Click. She hung up, and the dead tone on the other end began to sound like the sea, waves crashing through the static. I didn't know what to do. The idea that Artie had been there so close to my family hit me hard. My stomach turned in small, tight knots and my mind began to move faster and faster. I had images of Artie visiting my mother, my father, my sister. I could see him now, tall and wet and pale, stooping his way in through their doorways, leaving wet footprints on the carpet. I saw Dot's body again, drowned on dry land, and what the water had done to his features. To his corpse. I couldn't let that happen. Amy watched the thought process play out across my face. I could see her small frown of apathy and the way her bottom lip pulled itself a little tighter. She was only here because of her family after all. And despite all of her bluster, sometimes you could see that deep down she was scared. That this was a performance on her part as if she was anticipating something far worse from the world. I know where the well is, Max. 
she spoke with a strange sense of calm. The same tone you hear from people reporting an accident or a car crash, as if something came next. We had no other choice. I tried to speak as rationally as possible, given our situation. So what's the problem? We head there, see if we can figure this out. See if we can stop him. She touched the tattoo on her neck, tucked her hair behind her ear. Something happens there. She stared at the coffee grounds in the bottom of her mug, reached in with her fingers and rubbed the black sludge between them absentmindedly. She repeated herself, but her eyes seemed vacant. I can see it. Something happens there. There was something else in her voice. Sadness. Apprehension. I tried to reassure her. No, Amy. Something happened. She looked at me with her private smile, as if I was missing the point. We set off the next day for the well, which she told me was somewhere in the Black Rock Hills. She said the last time her mother had seen Artie was heading into the Black Rock Hills with my grandfather. They were in the hills for seven days and seven nights, and when my grandfather finally returned, it was alone and bruised, changed. We made a few preparations, stocking up on food from around the cabin, but it was more trying to fill the time than genuine forethought. The earth made it hard to walk, water large and heavy, and our shoes made a thick squelch as we made our way up the footpath. Apart from us, it was strangely empty. The foot of the hills was only an hour or so walk from the cabin, and on our way there, we had passed next to no one. The storm had changed the forest. What were once brown trunks were now a deep black, and water had made the slopes ragged and fresh. All the dust and detritus had been washed down, so that it collected in huge piles at the base of trees or the edge of flat clearings. It was as if the rain had some sort of intention, picking things up like a child and leaving them drenched. Instead of a compass, Amy had a small moth in a glass case, which would bang against the glass in that hopeless way moths do, as if it could see some urgent and pressing light that was invisible to us. She would watch it for a while, every half an hour or so, for nodding to herself and setting off in a slightly altered direction. As we reached the top, and I felt my lungs begin to sting, we heard something in the distance. Something that cut through the staccato of rainwater dripping from leaves. Something that sounded alive. The trees in front of us opened up to a large clearing, in the center of which was a huge puddle. A puddle so large it almost looked like a permanent feature of the forest. At the furthest edge of the puddle was a stag, or at least parts of a stag. All we could see were its antlers emerging from one end, and its hind legs from the other. A tree seemed to have fallen and trapped its head in forelegs. There is the sound, wet and desperate, as if the stag was screaming with every breath it had under the water and the noises burst to the surface in bubbles, so that it wasn't so much one noise, but several. I made a move to go and help it, unable to bear it for much longer. There was so much suffering in the scream, and I was reminded of screaming underwater as a child, the way my voice suddenly sounded so alien under the surface. Amy stopped me. Wait, it'll drown. I made a move forward and she grabbed my coat, pulling me back. She was surprisingly strong for someone her size. Wait. It'll drown, Amy. In fact, because of this, I gestured to her hand on my coat. It's probably drowned already. She looked at me, made a face. Think about it. Shit. I waited for a while. The scream continued. That half-human, half-animal, warbling scream continued. The antlers kept thrashing, churning the surface of the puddle into a white froth. The hind legs tried to find purchase somehow, 
but only work themselves deeper and deeper into the mud. I watched the thing struggle for a few minutes until I was sure. She was right. It had drowned already. Whatever this thing was, it had drowned a long time ago and was somehow still alive. Well, if not alive, moving, screaming. Amy held a finger to her lips. Suddenly it seemed very, very important that we stayed quiet. We made our way around the clearing, taking care not to step on any branches or speak. We could hear the pat 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 of rain dripping from leaves. Whenever the thing would take a second to regain its strength, before starting again, thrashing and wailing in the black water. We made it just before sundown. The well was situated in the middle of two large houses. They had thatched roofs and whilst I couldn't tell you much about architecture, I could tell you that they were old. So old that the forest seemed to have formed around them. As if before there were the trees and the stags and the rain, there were these two houses nestled together in secret. Before we entered the first house, Amy said a few words. She made a small movement with her hand and opened the door. I wrinkled my nose, expecting the stink of rotten age, the stink of dead things trapped in chimneys and walls, but to my surprise, there was nothing. There wasn't even dust on the tables. If anything, it looked as if it had been left in a hurry. Notebooks are scattered across the floor. Clothes are strewn everywhere, and there is an axe left propped against the wall. We were cautious, but too scared of the well to suggest splitting up, but not brave enough to suggest staying together. So we made ourselves busy picking up the notebooks, trying to find something that might help us. We were aware that we had to do something, that our being here was necessary to stop this, but had no idea what had happened here or what we had to do. I think if we had, we might have laughed straight away. In the notebooks, we found all sorts of things that only a week ago I would have never believed. Records of languages like gutter, that all had their own rules and requirements. High Mandarin, which can only be spoken inside certain places. Quarrel, which can only be spoken between lovers. Longchuck, Trick Tongue, Fei. Languages that rely entirely on someone else's answer, so that they can never be spoken alone. Languages can communicate things so dark and urgent that any living speakers would inevitably lose their minds. Languages for sinners and for saints, for drunks in the bottle, for artists and their art, for thieves and widows, for the dying and the dead. All of these languages that could never be written down, never translated into words on the page but instead could only be spoken. The notebooks only contain their histories, so far as our grandfathers knew them, details of their speakers and how they spread, notes on their syntax and context, on their dialects and geographies. Those that dedicated their lives to learning them were, are, known as tongues, collections of living languages, walking, talking histories. That's what our grandfathers were. Tongues. Travelers, scholars, obsessives. Try as we might, we couldn't find any journals, just collections of sporadic and often confused notes. We decided that we would have a better look in the morning, that when it was light, we would explore both the houses, see if we could find out more about whatever deal was made and what happened at the well. The well. Lying like an open mouth between the two houses, its presence the implication of a throat beneath the earth, a stomach made from stone. The well was like an itch that we couldn't scratch. We knew that we had to face it at some point, to work out what it meant, to figure out what it was that we had to do. But for now, we were tired, and had spent the whole day walking. The well could wait for one night. We got into our respective beds and lay for a while. Neither one of us could sleep. 
The forest was muted. Every now and again, something would scream in the distance. There would be a sound like a splintering wood. A scream somewhere burbled to itself. Amy spoke up. It was as if the dark gave her some cover. Hid whatever part of her it was that she didn't want me to see in the daylight. I didn't mention it earlier, Max. The recording. What we talked about. They weren't actually your grandfather's last words. They weren't? No. His last breath. Those two rasping sounds. They're not just inhales, exhales. They're words. In gutter. I swallowed a lump in my throat. And... If you listen closely, after your grandfather stops shouting, you can hear Artie say two things in gutter. It's quiet and it sounds like he's clearing his chest, but Artie's speaking. He tells your grandfather that he forgives him, and then he asks him a question. I bit my tongue and I clenched my fists under the blanket, digging my nails into my palm. He asks him if he's ready, Max. If he's ready to go. And what does my grandfather say? Remember how I was saying the part of the meaning of gutter lies in the tension between the two versions? That part of the meaning lies in the fact that a word can mean two things at once. I remember. Artie asked them if he's ready to go. If he's ready for what's next. And what your grandfather says with his last breath means two things. Yes. And no. I now know that deep below our feet something older than name stirred. It heard our hushed voices above it. And knowing that we had no other choice. It waited. It had waited all this time. What was one night... It did not sleep. It could not sleep. But it could dream. They had made an agreement. What the deal was wasn't clear. But it had cost them more than they had thought possible. It had cost them friends and lovers and in the end, each other. And the thing that slept below the hills, that dreamt so loud it made ripples on the surface, Wanted one thing. Blood. Their journals were not clear on when the deal was made. But they had been giving the thing below the hills what it wanted for years. Until it had grown to be too much. It had wanted one last gift. One last gift and it promised it would finally leave them be. It was to be my grandfather. They were to go up to the caves at the top of Black Rock Hills and make their way to the center, where Artie would slit his throat and lay him finally to rest. The decision had taken them days. They both wrote extensively about wanting it to be them that the other one could live a full life, about how they had to stop it somehow, and how this was the only way. But something happened when they were meant to make the decision. Whatever mistake my grandfather made meant he had never returned to the well, and so his journals were left uncompleted. But it was clear. It was meant to be my grandfather. Whether he deliberately pushed Artie down the well, or whether there was a change of heart on Artie's behalf, we didn't know. What we did know was that the well was directly above a stream that ran through the heart of the hills, deep underground. A stream that worked its way through a cave system so intricate it was like a mess of capillaries and veins. When Amy read the last of the journals, and we both realized what had passed between the two of them, she spoke bitterly. I knew it. Knew what? That a voynich that your family put themselves first. I grew defensive. We don't know that. All we know is that it was meant to be my grandfather, not what happened after are you stupid? What? 
At least I know about my family. We might lie or cheat or steal, but we do it for each other. The people we love. I know that. But you, you have no idea about any of it. I could see her building up to something, as if some storm was growing inside of her. Well now, whatever it is, is threatening my family, the people I love. Whatever it is down there, whatever it wants, I'm going to find out. And with that, she stood up, scattering the loose pages of the journals around her feet, and laughed. I was in shock for a moment, thinking about why this had happened. I imagined the way her mother must have talked about Artie. Her mother's grief she must only be able to see glimpses of as if through a keyhole. Her whole childhood, whole life. Knowing that it had to do with Artie's friend, but never knowing what. And now finding out that it was because of a coward and a liar, and seeing that coward's flesh and blood defend his actions when he knew nothing of what those actions actually meant. I wanted to apologize. I ran after Amy, but she was already gone, and had left footprints in the wet earth leading up the hills. I followed, trying to run, but each step made my feet sink deeper and deeper into the mud. I could feel the muscles in my legs begin to tire, and just when I thought that I would have to stop, and I would lose her, I saw the opening to a cave. The cave. I didn't hesitate and went straight in, shouting her name, crouching to fit through the tighter squeezes. I was going too fast though, and before long I realized that I had taken a couple of turns on instinct, and that I had no idea where I was. And not only that, but I had lost Amy. Somewhere along the way, with all these twists and turns, I had lost her. When I tried to turn back, it was clear that I was lost. Completely and utterly lost. There was a light that seemed to come from within the reflection on the rocks. As if in that mere world, everything was illuminated by some ghostly glow. In turn, the glow from the reflection cast a dim light over the tunnels that I was in. The rock was wet to the touch. And as I progressed further and further in the cave, it began to shrink, like the tapering of a throat, and I found myself bending more and more to fit through gaps. I couldn't go back. I tried calling for Amy, but my voice echoed hopelessly until it faded out, mocking me. There was another sound in between the echoes, something like a scrambling and a panting far away. I had an image of the stag following our scent, some drowned thing soaked to core and rotting, stalking me. I could see it now, all sinew and soil, relentless, hungry. I tried to push it from my mind. I kept on. Whenever I would press myself against a rock to squeeze past, or have to crouch under a low-hanging ceiling, I would see a reflection just for a second, only millimeters away. Except it wouldn't be my face, but the face of someone else. Distorted, pale, gaunt. My grandfather, my father, Artie, Dot, and then faces that I didn't recognize. A boy who had my face but Amy's nose. A woman with a scar that split her face in two. And each time I grew closer to the rock, faces would leer at me, examine me with their dead eyes. Once or twice, I was sure that I saw Amy, but I couldn't have. Just when I thought that I must have found myself in some huge loop, that I would be stuck underground for the rest of my life, endlessly stalking these caves, seeing the faces of everyone I had ever known staring back at me, I stumbled out and onto the shore. In front of me, there lay a vast and black ocean shored by gray slate that burst from the earth at severe angles. As with the cave, I couldn't tell where the light was coming from, only that I could see well enough to make out a small boat on shore. And in that boat, Artie and Amy. I made my way down the slate cautiously, testing each step with my weight before committing. They hadn't seen me yet, and whilst I was sure they weren't watching, 
I bent down and picked up a long, hard piece of stone. I thought if I needed, if Amy had somehow been turned like Artie, I could at least try to use this to fend them off. It was a dark thought, and I'm not proud of it. But the feeling of the stone in my hand at least gave me some sort of comfort. But even when they saw me, they did not react. They instead seemed entirely focused on their own private conversation. In between the sound of the waves, in that lull when one crested and smashed into the shore, and another began to swell behind it, I could hear something in the distance. Something like voices, screaming and bellowing over each other, so that it became one awful sound. But it was only present for a moment at a time, and each time I would try to tune into it, a wave would crash, and I would lose it. When I grew close enough to see their faces, I slipped the stone into my pocket, just in case. I finally reached the boat, at the end of a stone pier. It was a small, black craft that bobbed aimlessly in the water. Artie sat at the front, holding an oar in each hand. He looked to me. You look just like your grandfather. I watched a private smile play over his face and couldn't help but see Amy in the expression. Well, what are you waiting for? Get in. His voice was deep and rasping, the consequence of years of drink and smoking, no doubt. But there was no malice there. If anything, it was these same tone parents used with their children, caring and patient. I looked to Amy. She nodded. And so I got into the craft, sitting on the only other bench, so that I was pressed against Amy and facing Artie. I could see his face properly now, all the crags and trenches of old age, the yellowing of his cornea, the way his teeth were stained to slate brown. He cracked a grin, and it seemed like every single one of his teeth was at its own angle. And hunching over and yanking his shoulders back in one motion, he began to row us out to sea. As we rowed further and further out, the shouting got louder, and in the distance I could just make out what seemed to be a huge dark pillar, dark and crooked. The boat seemed just about to capsize at any moment, but each time I thought a huge black wave would sweep all of us off the deck, the boat would bob just above it, and we would keep moving forward. My hands grew clammy. I didn't want to think about what lay below us, what things lived and died in the depths of this underground sea. Sometimes, a way away, the surface would break as if something was coming up for air. As we grew closer to the crooked thing, it came into focus. A tower. I could make out tiny figures running to and fro and realized that the crooked tower was ringed by dozens of wooden construction platforms, which went in a spiral all the way to the top, like the slide on a helter-skelter. The thing was staggeringly huge, but I had no frame of reference to compare to, only that it emerged from the water and rose up as far as I could see. Artie spoke up. Babble. I raised an eyebrow. Sorry? We were growing closer now, and I could see that in fact the figures were running up and down the structure, grabbing pieces of rotten black wood from the base and sprinting their way to the top, somewhere so high that I could barely make it out. The Tower of Babel, Artie said. The sea keeps rising, and they keep building, if not. As if on cue... A short woman at the bottom bent to grab a piece of the platform that had just been submerged, and something grabbed at her wrist. She struggled for a second or two, screaming in some incomprehensible tongue, before she was pulled headfirst under the waves. The builders around her didn't even look, and kept shouting in their own private languages, hauling wood from just above the water to the very top. Amy gave a start, spoke up, and the boat rocked. Why don't we help them? Offer some a chance to get off, to come with us. 
I didn't even know where we were going, let alone trust any of them enough to offer them a space in this already cramped boat. Artie shook his head. They couldn't understand you even if we tried. They're cursed to never understand each other, no matter how hard they try, to perpetually build up and up and up to escape the rising water, surrounded by people, but alone, alone and scared, and trying to comprehend all. He gestured up, to the tower, to the dark above it. This. There was another scream, and all I could see was the wake of another builder pulled into the water, a small pool of white froth, and then nothing. Some say we once all spoke the same language, and using that true language we tried to build a tower to God. They say this is his punishment. Amy looked at him, and the way she hung on his words was like she was making up for all of their lost time. She was a child again, at his feet by the fire, in awe at his age and grace. I'm not sure I believe that entirely, but they've got to have done something to end up here, I suppose. Is that where we're going? Artie laughed, a black, harsh sound. Not for you, boy. Maybe at the end of it all, you'll find yourself washed up on the tower. But for now, you're needed somewhere else. We adjusted our course slightly and began to move past the tower. The screams and bellows began to fade. I turned to watch it disappear. The thousands of people desperately trying to build it. The way it curved and bent under its own weight. The platforms like a wet skeleton. The way it let out a thunderous creak every now and again as if its very core was splintering. Our families made a pact with forces down here. Many did. Maybe it was after the original tower fell. Maybe it was much later. All I know is that whatever is down here needs things from us. Offers gifts in return. His eyes glazed over for a second. Regret. A memory. It's easy to get carried away. A scream near the top. Someone carrying a huge plank staggered. The others couldn't wait. They barged past, and they fell into the sea below. Into the jaws of something waiting. Something so large that, when it moved, it pulled the surface of the water after it. And for a second, there was a huge aquas crater. For a second, I thought I could see a familiar stoop, just above eye level. Even though we were far away, I was convinced that for a second I had seen Dot, but he was swallowed by the crowd before I could be sure. Was that Dot? Artie looked unfazed. The man wasn't a Saint Max. I don't know is the truth. Could be. I tried to see Dot again, but there was nothing. I'm sure that was. I mean, it looked like. Artie looked past me. I'm sorry it had to be like this, Max. I could tell that he meant it. I'm sorry about Dot drowning. He was a friend to your father, I know. It wasn't my choice to do what we did to him. It had to have you here, you see. You have to do this. Do what? You'll see. And Amy, you know what's to come. And you think you're right. She paused for a moment, bit her lip, nodded. All right, all right. There's no dissuading you, I suppose. She shook her head. You know, your ancestors tried to plot this place once, Max. A long, long time ago. Wrote it all down. But once the manuscript reached the surface, it turned to nonsense. Gibberish. He paused, thinking but still rowing, his body at a steady rhythm. Nothing down here makes much sense on the surface. 
Try explaining that. He pointed to the Tower of Babel, to that endless uh, crooked tower. To anyone on the surface, there are very few who could understand it. I thought on this for a while, and as the tower faded from view, I could just start to make out a distant shore. Amy must have seen it too because she went a little pale, and I felt her body stiffen against mine. She was afraid. Whatever happened between me and your grandfather, you know it's forgiven. He was saying this as much to me as to Amy. In the scheme of things, we were so young. We were drunk and arrogant, and both of us couldn't bear the thought of a world without the other. We were meant to come down here together, to meet the thing beneath the hills and face it. But we argued. He wanted it to be him. I wanted it to be me. We were growing closer to the shore now, and I could tell Amy was nervous next to me. She was chewing on her lip, running her hands through that bird nest of hair, making silent words with her lips. Whatever happened, happened. That was our turn. Now it's yours. And we disembarked from the small boat onto this new shore and said our goodbyes to Artie. Something had passed between him and Amy, I'm sure of it. All this time, and I'd have thought that they'd have much more to say to each other, but they communicated in small looks and tilts of the head. He furrowed his brow, raised his eyebrows, and she nodded. She was sure. He wasn't. He studied me for a long time, rubbing his jaw. I felt for a moment something piercing behind those eyes, something vicious and with the raw intelligence of a trapped animal. I felt him look past me, through me, into me. I did not know if he was seeing my grandfather or me. Whatever it was, he didn't entirely trust me. Not yet. This all had the texture of a dream, and for a second I thought maybe it was. Some fever dream I would wake up from in a week's time. But a cold salt wind rolled off the water and buffeted me and I knew this was all too real. Happening. Even though that I dream of this, of this underground sea and the crooked tower and the great beast and Nardi for the rest of my life, I know it was real. It had to be. Slowly, wordlessly, Artie began to paddle back out into that vast sea, lifting his cap to us as he laughed. Amy squeezed my hand, so tight that I thought a knuckle might pop and then let go. My hand twitched slightly, tried to find hers again for just a second, but it was gone. She looked at me intensely, the same way her grandfather just had, before walking ahead. Keep up. I tried to keep up with her fast pace, and I found myself slightly out of breath as we had reached the top of the spit of rock. The tower was inaudible now, and all I could hear was the crash of the waves and my breath. As we climbed up, we drew closer and closer to what seemed to be two doorways hewn into the stone. There was no door, only a faint flickering light that indicated there was something inside each of them. When we had reached the two doorways, Amy gave my hand one last squeeze, looked at me as if she was memorizing every last detail of my face. There was something else there though. Was she scared? She turned away and entered her own doorway. Still to this day, I do not know what Amy saw in there. I don't think I ever will. All I know is that, when I entered later to do what I had to do, her cheeks would be wet with tears, and there would be blood on the stone. I entered my doorway, and found myself in a round, black chamber, a chamber made from something like obsidian, jagged and reflective and slick and somehow alive. The thing that dreams under the hills reached into me, it reached into me, 
crawled up my spine and into my brain and spat black images onto my eyelids. I staggered under the weight of it, finding myself on my knees, head spinning, mouth dry and tasting like tar. I could see on every wall in front of me, on every surface, hundreds of images. My father, my grandfather, his father, and his father before him. The people that I somehow knew were my sons and my daughters, and their sons and daughters. Until I could see my family stretching out for hundreds and hundreds of years on either side of me, and I could see them all sin. I could see them all maim and lie and cheat and steal, and beg and fight and hurt and wail, and I could see it all as if it was happening this very second. And I could feel it, immediate, as if it had always been there. Images flickered on every available surface, on my eyelids, the walls, the palm of my hands, scenes I could recognize. My grandfather pushing Artie down the well, as they had argued, pushing his chest and shouting over and over, it should be me, it should be me. My grandfather a week later, beating some poor man senseless because he looked like his old friend, and he couldn't bear to see his face. The grief that began to live in the silence and the whistle of the kettle. Seems I couldn't. Someone who looked just like me, but far, far in the past, robbing a man in a back street, cutting first his purse and then his stomach, and then his throat, when he can see that he recognizes him, leaving him to bleed out amongst the stench of shit and dirty water. And I knew then that endlessly either side of me was suffering, and I could see my children, who I did not know yet but already loved, suffering, and the thing that dreamt below the hills offered me a way out. It was simple. All it needed was blood. It was the way it had always been. My grandfather had been greedy, wanted it too much. The thing had only asked for something in return, and it had been denied it. I could see Amy in her chamber, semi-comatose like me, the weight of generations bearing down on her. I could feel the piece of stone in my pocket, long and hard, and the thing showed me the image of Amy's head, wet with blood, and how it was only that simple. It showed me Amy, dead. It had made it clear to me. It only wanted one thing. One thing, and I could leave this place shedding memories like snakeskin, free of the weight of all of this. One thing, and I could put this all to rest. One movement, precise and painless, and all of this grief, all of this horror could just fade away. Thoughts played in my mind. Memories played across the obsidian surfaces like images projected on a screen. Maybe the reason nothing makes sense down here is because it shouldn't. Maybe it's not only my right to kill her, but my duty. I tested the weight of the stone in my hand. I imagined how easy it would be, how small and fragile her skull must be beneath her skin. I thought of the vision I'd had, the back of her head slick with blood. But my mind kept going, kept working, threw up more images. I saw her hunched in the rain outside of my house. I saw the way she confessed she knew gutter as if she had revealed something ugly and real inside of her. I saw her lamp, the way she saw her grandfather, the way she saw me. And then I knew that the thing under the hills lied. It had lied to my grandfather and to his father and to me. It did not offer any solution to this. It didn't have any, because there was none. And while it would never leave our families alone, while it would always dwell here, dream here. It would not make me a murderer. It would always find a way to offer a choice. That's how it has always been, and how it will always be. I just had to make the right one. Slowly, I forced my way to my feet, turned away from the images playing across every surface. I left my chamber and I walked to Amy's. Every step sent fresh memories, fresh regrets, 
fresh wounds racing through me. I gritted my teeth, kept going. She was sat in the corner, pale, wide-eyed, watching the entrance. When she saw me, she flinched for a second, but I held my hands up, empty. Her nose was bleeding, as it had dripped from her chin onto the floor. She must have taken a fall when she came in, when the weight of the memories of hundreds of years hit her all at once. She was bruised and bleeding, but she was alive. And so together, we left the chambers, climbed back down the stone shore, and walked until we found an empty boat. And we rode together back across the vast sea, and past the tower, and went back through those wet tunnels, and I followed her the whole way. And as we got closer and closer to the surface, we began to see light, real light. I now know the thing under the hills can't be sated. It will always be there, and it'll be there for my children, and my children's children, and their children in turn. And it will offer them a choice the way it always has, and it will promise pleasure or riches or love. And they will have to reckon with it the same way I did. We'll have to reckon with the mistakes of their forefathers. With the knowledge that our spirits will not rest. With the knowledge of all the grief and suffering that is past and that is to come. And with the crooked tower and that vast underground sea. But I hope when the thing beneath the hills shows them my mistakes and my father's and my grandfather's. They will at least know one thing. No matter what they choose, they are not alone. They never have been. We made our way out of the cave mouth and collapsed into the light. We spent the next few days in the houses by the well. We slept, ate, chopped wood to make fire, organized our grandfather's journals, hunted rabbits, made stew. The forest was quiet, at rest. I brought it up one morning as we gathered water from a nearby brook. You and Artie, in the boat, he asked you if you were sure. Sure of what? Amy looked pained, as if she didn't want to say what was next. It's nothing. It was nothing. Amy. She rolled her eyes. Fine then. When I got to the boat, he told me about the choice that you had to make. The choice you had to make to atone for your grandfather. You knew. I thought about how I had felt the weight of the stone in my hand. I knew what it would ask you. And you knew what I would do, right? She shook her head. I had a hunch. The brook chattered away happily to itself. She spoke again. I trusted you, I guess. And as we made our way back, content and in comfortable silence, through the trees and the muted morning light, I noticed that the soil was no longer waterlogged. The storm had passed, and the earth beneath our feet was dry.